Well, good morning, everybody. Ben and Woods, 97.3 The Fan. Let's get our heads right on uh, today, Tuesday, February 6th, 2024. Great to be here with you on a very wet, wet morning. It's been the been the case the last uh, last few days, certainly. It was very, very slick this morning. So I, I hydroplaned three or four times, uh, and I was going like 50 miles an hour. Uh, be careful out there. Be careful. Want you alive uh, better than dead. That's absolutely the case. I'm Woodsy. That's Paul Rindel. He's the executive producer. Good morning, Paulie. Yes, better than dead. Better than dead. Absolutely. Benjamin Higgins, your friendly neighborhood sports anchor and almost news anchor last night. Yeah. yeah Good morning. It was a weird, uh, weird night last night. First of all, you're absolutely right. Be careful out on the roadways. Hydroplaning. That word sounds like it's fun. It's not. It's yeah, not fun. It's like, Ooh, let's go ooh, hydroplaning. Let's go hydroplaning. That's you gonna guys be fun. Hydroplane this weekend? Really, really not that much fun. Not at all. And uh, shout out last night on my way home from Channel Ten to the the L A limousine bus going ninety on my left that nearly ran me off the road. Appreciate that. Shout out L A limousine. <laughs> well done, guys. But uh, yeah, be careful out on the roadways today. Uh, yeah, I almost. I guess you could call me like the vice president of the news anchoring. If yeah. anything happened to the news anchor, yes, then I had to be ready to step in. So I sat on the um, the anchor desk all evening from uh, from five to seven thirty. So from the start of the five o'clock show through the end of our seven o'clock news at seven thirty, with Wale, our anchor, out in the field, you know, out in the rain in, in the. In the tough conditions, you never know if the uh, the feed might break down for yeah. some reason. It goes down. Someone needs to be sitting there to take over the newscast. So bullpen. That is uh, for the time being. My five to seven thirty responsibility is to uh, sit and be ready just in case. So you, uh, that's going to be for a while because the uh, yeah when he's out in the field and we're trying to do more anchoring out in the field. So I get to uh, I get to just sit and I mean I can work on my laptop in the studio. Take but... selfies and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I took a selfie last night. You can see Wale on the out, you know, by the uh, the pier, you know, making sure it doesn't fall into the ocean or something. Doing the real work while I I do uh, no work and just sit there and just wait, just wait, yeah. just in case, just, just wait, just in case. I don't, I could do this show this way too. You guys. You do the show, and, and if something, you, if we something need you, happened to you, like, if you know, if your microphones stopped working, or I could be like, I could jump right in and start doing the show, or be like, uh, yeah, Paulie, it was a great dead night yet uh, last night. There was really nothing on, so I flipped on, I flipped on randomly the Clippers game, but I didn't see the end. I have no idea who won. Oh, all right. It's uh, it's Ben Higgins here, yep. uh, Paul and Woods. Um, Let's go back to the uh, studio. Back to the studio. Uh, and uh, you know what? Uh, you were just talking about the Clippers. I think they did win that game last okay. night over the Atlanta Hawks, one forty nine, one forty four. Kawhi Leonard, thirty six big points as the Clippers have won twenty six of their last thirty one games. One of the hottest teams, if not the hottest team in the entire NBA. Now back to Woods and Paul. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Paulie, I'm glad. Thank you, Ben, for that update. <laughs> and we'll be back with you when we need some some basketball information. That actually could work pretty good. It might be a little boring for you. It's a little early to get up to have to come in and do that, um, honestly. But, oh, look at him. He's sitting oh, back. Wow. I want to talk about your selfie, though, that you took in the studio. And I saw that you tweeted it. And I saw that you posted it to your in- – the shock and – not horror, but the shock and awe I felt when I was on Instagram and I saw the little circle at the top with Ben's <laughs> smiling face on it, a story. Oh, and I went – Oh, no. He I got went, hacked. Oh, God. Oh, no. Yeah. There's going to be some – Selling uh, Ray Bans or something, some sort of shoes and I, and Chong gummies. And I, I go, oh crap! I say, I thought the same thing. I thought he got hacked, and then I click on it. And there's his smiling face, and I went, well, look at this guy out here posting selfies to his story. Apparently, I had a little extra time on my hands to finally figure out how to tag myself with a location and look at add it. some labels in the background. All just, those just fancy just... things that I don't have to do when I post a photo on Twitter. Now I posted. X slash Twitter photos yeah. quite you know often, but I just never kind of got into the whole Instagram story. Instagram thing. was launched in 2010. Yeah, it is 2024. Yeah, the story feature is much newer. That's it's ah, maybe two or three years. Oh, tops, I don't know right? about that, pal. I don't know about that. I got stories from a long time ago. Yeah. Just a shade under a decade it took you to learn <laughs> how to post one story of one picture. Now listen, I'm gonna give you I'll give you a little break here. The reels and stuff, The re- I did a reel. It took me about a month, and it was terrible. I had repeating pictures in it. That was very difficult. This is why Polly is invaluable to us. <laughs> invaluable, because if it were just you and me, I'd be running 99.9%. 
if it was just me and him, I'd be like, I'm so glad you learned how to do stories now because now you can post one to Ben and Woods. But uh, no, you looked you look good in your in your story, um, and I'm glad that you do it. Post more of them. Paul says I'm like the uh, the, the people in those um, progressive insurance. Yeah, you're turning into your parents' commercials. I think even my parents know how to post stories. Like, hey, uh, sliding sliding into the DMs. That looks like fun. You're not ready for that. You're not ready. So you're not, you're not ready for that. So the yeah. newest commercial with LL Cool J in it, and the guy's like trying to take a selfie. He's like, "All right, so three, three, three two, two, no, 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 no countdown. No, there's no countdown anymore. No countdown. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. <laughs> Just incredible. Yeah, I often." You know, the, the, this job these days is so much more than just getting on and shooting the breeze and talking about sports or whatever. Um, you do have to be very active on social media. You have to have, you know, a show Twitter, a show Instagram. You have to have your personal Instagram, your personal Twitter. It's a lot. It's a lot to manage on a daily basis, uh, to be sure. And, you know, I new platforms arise, and I go, <gasps> like, we, we have a TikTok. I don't think we've posted anything to it in over a year, as far as I know. Yeah, as far as you know. As far as I know. Have you? Yeah, I post every reel that goes up oh. on our Instagram and Twitter. It goes out on... <laughs> I have no idea. All I the have... press conferences every week. <laughs> I have no idea. I had no idea. I had no idea those were on TikTok. You need a Paul to be able to manage every single feed that's out that's there. exactly right, man. It's even... I mean, I'm not going to act like I'm a so social media guru or anything I'm like that. I'm a guru! That. <laughs> but... Yeah, it, get a guru! It is tough. I mean, at least Instagram and TikTok, <laughs> the dimensions are about the same yeah. with the videos, but then you're like, okay, well, do we well, want to make this a YouTube video? Then it needs to be horizontal. Do we want to put it on Twitter? How do we want it to look? I like Sam. I like Sammy. Sammy has mastered the art of TikTok. Mm-hmm. And I like his TikToks. I have ideas for TikToks, but I don't want to execute them. I would need you at my – because I have an idea of like, all right, because Sammy does – here's the day in the life of a MLB broadcaster or a you know pre- and post-game. I would love to do morning show. Like this is the life of – this is what it looks like to host a morning show. But I can't – you, you want to meet me at my house at 4.30 tomorrow morning, come over and shoot this TikTok of me? I don't think so. And no. I'm not certainly not about to figure it out on my own. It would take me a month. So I'm no better. But I do know how to do stories, and I'm glad you do, too. Right, maybe this is a homework assignment for all of us, and by all of us, I mean you and me. Yeah. Uh, you can still take the videos and then send them to and me, we can and I can put them paste together. Paste them? Okay. All right. Maybe we'll do that. I'll do a day in the life we'll of a, a morning show. have a voiceover. Yeah. Be great. I'm a morning radio Can host. I say? Well, not just a day in the life of a morning show host. The Oh, yeah. The number 16. The number 16 in the country. ranked yeah. morning show host. Right. You know I love my rankings. You love rankings. Aztecs, we did uh, crack the top 25. Aztecs back in the top 25 at number 24, but that slides in eight slots below. That's right. Ben and Woods, uh, yours truly, our show, was ranked uh, number 16th in the country for major market morning shows this morning by Barrett Sports Media. So congratulations to you guys and uh, all of us for cracking. This is our highest ranking ever, correct? It is. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the number one morning show in a major market is going to be out of guess, New York. It's Boomer and Geo. <laughs> well, I'm promoting Boomer every day on every our day. show, so obviously they're going to be number one. Then you got you got D, you got a, a DC, then you got Chicago, then you got Boston, then you got Dallas. Boston. Then you got Dallas. Then you got Boston again. You got Philly. You got Minneapolis, Detroit, San Francisco, New York again, Chicago again, Seattle, Denver, and then lowly old Ben and Woods from San Diego, California. I didn't hear any uh, Los Angeleses. Uh, I didn't hear any Los Angeleses of, uh, ben either. Ben and Woods here in San Diego in the top uh, top twenty. No, who, who, there aren't any who in does the top twenty. Local L.A. morning radio. No idea. I have no idea, man. But all I know is, uh, you know, a lot of national shows run out of L.A., but that's not what this is. It's a very, very, very prestigious honor, as far as you know, the <laughs> listener. It's very prestigious. You, I mean, I just like rankings. You I, know I, I know. I, I did too. Rankings. Hey, listen, I'm not going to tell you I didn't get a little jolt this morning when I, I saw that. It makes me feel good. We've put a lot of work into this show. Our tier ones are the best in the business. and We've um, been on this list before. That's the highest we've been. That's right. I 16. That was really Sweet cool. 16. Yeah. Sweet 16. That's exactly right. Sailor Liver says we'd be top 10 if we played more Bob Dylan. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I couldn't agree more. I uh, tweeted last night I'd like to do a show of nothing but Johnny Hamcheck audio. And Roll Tide Willie audio. I do four hours of two of my favorite things that delight me on the internet these days. Uh, before we go to break, I want to take this moment, if you guys don't mind, to wish my little guy, Bo Woods, 
very happy sixth birthday. <laughs> I love him, uh, obviously, more than anything in the world. And he has been, this is the sixth birthday we've had. Like, we started the show yeah. right when he was a baby. And uh, so he's grown like, up. Like six weeks old. Yeah, he's grown <laughs> up with this uh, with this show. And I've grown up with this show. And I've grown up being his dad. And he is the most special, uh, beautiful, sweet, sassy, foul-mouthed little turd in the world. And I just... I love him. He's changed my life uh, forever. I know he's up right now because he's he gets up early, and I know he's listening. So, Bobo, I'm very proud of you. I love you so much, and uh, can't wait to hang out with you today. I'm picking him up early from school, a little Jersey Mike's action, and then tonight, Benny Hanna, 4.30 reservation. Oh. That's how we do it at my house, 4.30 reservation at Benny Hanna. Is he going with you, or did you get a sitter? No, I'm going with myself. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hannah's not coming. Nobody's coming. But, uh... That kid is is so cool. The uh, the post you sent yesterday from the day he was uh, born oh. when they did the Fox News report and talked about his grandfather Lauren, his namesake, because he's Lauren Bo Woods yep. was uh, mm, that got it, me. It got me bit, good, yeah. man. I I was sitting at the table uh, and I I posted every year. It was the day he was born. They did a little a little little feature on the news. I was we were blown away. We had no idea. Um, I remember my mother-in-law getting pictures and videos, and she sent them over to Kathleen Bade at Fox 5, and they did a little a little tribute. And I watched that every year on his birthday, and I just sobbed. I just sobbed last night watching that because uh, certainly the most special day of my life uh, by far. So happy birthday, buddy. I love you. We've got a song for you. He had a request. He wanted to go to break uh, with our song, Mine and His. So uh, we'll hit a little Live Forever by Oasis. And then we'll be back and set up the show. Yeah, uh, we'll hand out the menu. And unfortunately, an early shout out to his family yeah. this morning here on Ben and Dang, Woods when man. we come back. So from the highs of the highs, birthday, sixth birthday, to the lows of a shout out to his family. That's coming up next. Uh, check of traffic. It is, it is dangerous out there. Be very, very careful. If you don't have to go, I'd say just don't go this morning. Just uh, stick around and listen to more Ben and Woods on San Diego's number one sports station and the number 16 in morning show Woo! in the country yeah. on 97.3 The Fan.
Yeah, a little uh, bad news waking up to that this morning. Yeah, sad news. Uh, Country music star Toby Keith passed away yesterday at the age of 62. He was diagnosed with stomach cancer back in 2021. And uh, according to his family, Toby Keith passed peacefully last night, surrounded by his family. He fought his fight with grace and courage. Please respect the privacy of his family at this time. And I did not know uh, that he had that he was ill. I had no idea. I didn't either, yeah. My uh, my mother in law is a massive Toby Keith fan. I'm pretty sure she's like jumped up on stage with him. She buys those front row tickets. I'm <laughs> I think she might have duetted with him once or twice. But huge, huge Toby Keith uh, fan. He uh, he uh, he has five or six songs that I absolutely love. He was on that line. For me, of like, oh, okay, kind of 90s country, and then it, like, he had some songs you're like, oh, no, 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 you were doing so good. And, you Don't know. say what songs, because that right. will offend somebody right, yeah, very for, much, because those no, songs are wildly popular. It, but uh, Like Red Solo Cup. I it's mean, the hokey, it's, it's the hokey stuff. But, yeah. like, his, like, meaningful songs were really, really good. Really, really good. So rest in peace. Shout out to his family, uh, certainly. I uh, shout out to his family. Yeah, yeah. I am. Um, I'm not the the big cowboy country guy, but Toby you don't Keith, say Toby. Toby <laughs> Keith actually <laughs> played a significant role for a few years in our life because when our children were very young, uh, you know, Bo and Taylor's age and a little younger. You know how kids are, and there's just certain songs that will make them happy. And yeah, oh, when yeah. you need to make your kids happy, you will play pretty much anything. And I've talked about when they were babies, I'd have to drive around with John Mayer on and <laughs> sitting there in the back seat to get them to go to sleep. But as they got a little bit older, they became obsessed with one particular Toby Keith song. He did a rendition of that that kids like lullaby yeah. Mockingbird with his daughter, Crystal. Oh. Keith, and so this was constantly. She's got a really, good she's got voice. a really good voice, Man. and we yeah. probably had to listen to that, you know, as kids go, four forty-five thousand oh, yeah. times, you know, <laughs> over a three-year period, and you kind of. You get a little tired of it, but you also then think about it nostalgically and you remember how happy it made your children to play that yeah, song a no, million times. No question, man. 62 years old, God way dang. too young. Um, I think we need to, he needs a full one, Polly. I think he needs the full, the full shot. The, full, oh, the whole treatment? Yeah. yeah the whole and I really hope we, we can see more unity and more peace when already things are so difficult. It's true. So, shout out to his family. Best audio that's ever lived. It just is delights me every time I the full one just murders me every time, just kills me every single time. I love it. Rest in peace to uh, Toby Keith. Got a good show coming up here on a Tuesday. Um, in our eight o'clock hour, I'll work a little bit backwards because I want to make sure that everybody knows eight thirty five this morning. Uh, this is a rare treat, actually, for Ben and Woods. Uh, we've only talked to him on the show just just once before. Yeah, one time. One yeah. time before, but we will be joined by Padres pitching coach Ruben Niebla as uh, he gets ready to report to spring training with the pitchers and catchers this weekend. Got to see Ruben yesterday as we made our way out to the uh, ribbon-cutting ceremony for the biomechanics lab that the Padres and PLNU have put uh, put up together. Just Actually, it's just a couple of minutes away from our station. Incredible facility. So cool. Uh, really, really neat stuff. Cutting-edge technology that they're going to use to, uh, you know, help performance, uh, you know, help keep guys healthy. It's really interesting stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit, and obviously we'll pick Ruben's brain about a very new-look pitching staff. I mean... Really new look, some exciting new arms, uh, the bullpen that's been completely revamped, but it's going to look different. Uh, kind of optimistic about what at least that part of the Padres offseason and what they've done and put together. They may still need a little bit more depth, but uh, but Ruben will be with us at 835 and Woods. I'm looking forward to that conversation. As am I. Did he uh, dap you up yesterday? I did not actually oh, make physical bad. contact. <sighs> Tough scene. For there was you. a lot of people there, and well, I never I mean, found he... myself right there in proximity. Tough scene. He sought me out. So. With Ruben the Able. Yeah. He sought you out. Yeah. Oh, that's impressive. He came up behind me and put his hands on my shoulder. Yeah. That kind of scared me. Scared and you? He said, hey, how you doing? 
Paulie goes, all right, 8.30 tomorrow. Don't be late. Yeah. <laughs> Did have a few tier ones that came up and said hello. Yeah, well. some really nice folks out uh, there. People uh, associated with PLNU, their athletic director, Ethan Hamilton, who's a big listener of the show as well, was there. Man, and that it, facility was awesome. It was a learning experience as well it's for me. It's really cool to see that stuff in action. And, um, yeah, well, I want to talk to him about the information and, and all of that. It really – it it – it's a fascinating part of the game and where the game is going. Um, and I love that. I want to ask him about the blending of the old, you know, he's a pretty old school dude. I want to ask him about the blending of the old school and the new school, which is really the only way to do it. You know, that you can't have too much of one and, and not enough of the other. And he, that dude looks like he has embraced this fully. So I'm excited to talk to him. We saw you Darvish out there yesterday. I didn't see Yuki Matsui. Was, I, yep. I, I assume was he, he was the one that was sitting, was sitting next right to next you, right? right? Yeah, next in the, uh, during the, the little news conference or during the uh, the actual ceremony. You forget how tall you Darvish is. Yeah. I mean, he is tall. And Yuki Matsui, I believe, is a short king. So um, I, I didn't. I mean, me and Ben are tall. Tall. And he's a good two yeah. inches taller. <laughs> I know, dude. He's much more lithe uh, than both of you guys as well. Yes. Which is to be expected. But yes. uh, no, it was a fun, fun little excursion uh, yesterday. Uh, Seven o'clock hour. Uh, we will have our usual features. Don't do this. Take on Woods. Uh, a couple of great prizes today to give away, including uh, the usual trip to Las Vegas qualification. We also have Padre Spring training tickets to give away. At seven o'clock, I want to talk a little bit about. How Peter Seidler seems to have changed baseball a little bit with a move the <laughs> Kansas City Royals made. And this screamed. This screamed Padres, A.J. Preller, <laughs> Peter Seidler all over it when they signed Bobby Witt Jr. to an 11-year, $288 million contract extension. Their young shortstop very early in his major league career. This is a trend. Padres were somewhat trendsetters. The Braves did, did it a little bit as well. The Padres took it to another level, though. And as a small market team, the Kansas City Royals now seem to at least be going a little bit down the road that the Padres did, which is interesting uh, for that franchise and pretty exciting for their fan base. So we'll do that in the 7 o'clock hour. And then next, uh, I want to talk more about the Padres. We had their CEO on yesterday. I know uh, our midday show, Craig talked about it. Uh, Chris and Gwen talked about it in the afternoon as well. Uh, any thoughts that anyone had? Any reaction a day later to what you heard from Eric Gruppner yesterday? We can get into that as well and share more of our, uh, our stories and experiences uh, from yesterday's Biomechanics Lab ribbon-cutting ceremony opening and uh, what that could do. Uh, for the Padres, I mean, I think, you know, it's not one of those, you know, instant tangible things that you'll see right away on the field. It's more of a just a slight edge that maybe you can get over your competition. Playing and, and, a long game. Yeah, and Ruben talked about it a little bit yesterday as well. But this is this is something the Padres hope will will make them more competitive, yep. uh, you know, going forward in the future. So we'll get to that coming up as well. New power rankings out yesterday from ESPN and Major League Baseball. A little early. Uh, spring training not quite here yet. And you can – I was going to say, I don't know, is 16 good to be ranked in the country? And I thought – it's not great, but then this morning I have a different perspective on 16. Feels all right to be number 16. 16 is basically like being number one. 16 is pretty good, yeah, right? Yeah, 16 is you know. basically like being so number one can, in my book. We can talk about where the, uh, the national media has the Padres <laughs> and the national media has Ben and Woods ranked this morning in the top 20. So we'll get to all of that coming up. Uh, good morning to you. It's Ben and Woods. We'll be right back uh, with some Padres talk on the biomechanics lab and more next here on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
Just had one of those uh, cut-ins with Boomer Esiason during our break, if you were listening. Of course, number one ranked morning show in America with Boomer. You can also catch him weekly, kick off with Boomer and Valenti, Fridays at 7 p.m. Here on 97.3 The Fan as they talk NFL, all the biggest stories in the league, packed into one hour on the Odyssey app as well. It's presented nationally by Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos, brought to you by those who drink it and by Lowe's, Lowe's knows home improvement. Yeah, uh, they're number one. We're number 16. Not bad. Not bad at all. Then again, the Padres were ranked number 16 yesterday by ESPN in their offseason power rankings. And I think if you had told me a year ago, because I don't remember exactly where they were, but it was probably top five, uh, certainly, going into last season, that stepping back to 16 would be a little disappointing. So I guess it's all a matter of perspective, (laughs) because I was excited about us moving up to 16, Maybe you're disappointed about the Padres moving down to 16, but uh, I would imagine the Texas Rangers started last year somewhere around 16. The Arizona Diamondbacks started probably much lower than 16 last year in terms of the power ranking. So where you're ranked I- on February 6th doesn't really matter uh, as opposed to where you're ranked on, on you know November 6th. Yeah, it's not that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah it doesn't matter. I did read the same thing. And it said that they – did they move up? I thought they were up from 17 was their last oh. ranking. Oh, like off-season, earlier in the off-season. Whatever the, or last the end of last time ESPN season. did yeah. their last power rankings, we were 17th. So now we've moved up. Doesn't doesn't really matter uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know. Uh, you know, all these rankings are kind of based on projections and, and off-season moves. And any time the national media are going to look at the Padres and go, well – Blake Snell is not, you know, no longer on the team, and Josh Hader is no longer on the team, and Juan Soto is traded. The initial reaction, of course, is going to, you know, we're not going to project them too high based on uh, those star players being gone. But I did see, uh, you know, after talking to Eric Gruppner yesterday and you know, trying to get a little bit into to budget stuff and, and the TV deal, the ESPN did come out with a report this morning that I thought was interesting. The Padres aren't, aren't alone. Whether or not this has anything to do with, with Valley Sports and the Regional Sports Network issues. How could it not, though? The There's about half of baseball that is currently in RSN limbo, ESPN calls it, where you know they don't know exactly what kind of revenue they're going to be getting from their Regional Sports Network, what their TV deal may look like beyond this season or even this season. And then there's half of the teams that are set like the uh, like the LA Dodgers they have a locked in contract with a different company and they're not you know no one's facing bankruptcy and they can expect lots of money coming in and this off season has been fairly split between the teams that are not in RSN limbo who have added you know over 100 million in payroll collectively and the teams that are in RSN limbo who have subtracted payroll and it's not just the Padres but uh, they point out the Brewers, the Twins, the Rockies, the Tigers, the Angels, all in that same Valley Sports Regional Sports Network boat, and all of them currently at lower payroll levels than they were last year. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the you know that's the proof that you that you need, and uh, I, I think I think most fans are pretty understanding of that. I do, I, I do think that uh, you know I've seen that sentiment a lot of. Yeah, man. I mean, you lose sixty million dollars. That's gonna. That's gonna. That's gonna make a dent. Um, and so, yeah, I, I. I think once they get that figured out, I don't. I don't know what the next steps are as far as, as figuring it out. Are they gonna do it on their own? Is MLB and and Eric told us yesterday, I believe. I don't want to misquote him, but uh, you know, Major League Baseball is kind of handling that for now. And boy, they've done such a great job with everything else. I look forward to uh, seeing how they do this. There are only three teams who are currently in that RSN purgatory who have actually added payroll in the off season, and all three of them have a special circumstance. It's the Texas Rangers, the Arizona Diamondbacks, so you're defending league champions, and the Atlanta Braves who are uh, clearly in a win-now sort of mode and have done a good job in keeping the payroll fairly manageable due to the contracts they've given out to begin with. And they play in a really big market, even though you know they may not know exactly what their TV deal looks like. But all the other teams in RSN purgatory, essentially, have scaled back payroll this offseason, which is interesting, to say the least. And you know, is it temporary? Is it permanent? We don't know. We don't know what it looks like beyond right now. But right now, 
there are a number of teams that are being at least very cautious this off season with potential uncertain revenue streams in their future. Well, and and you know one thing you you do know is that the fever for Padre, you know the Padres in San Diego is very high. I don't think anybody can deny that. Uh, I think there are a lot of people kind of peering over the fence right now, saying. Well, it doesn't. It's not quite as good as it looked last year. But we talked to Eric Krupner yesterday about um, season ticket sales are going well. People are still invested in this team. They want to talk about it. In fact, they they really don't like when you talk about anything else other than the Padres. the The news has just been very slow. the The cycle has been very slow this off season. Um, but I think the I think they're going to be okay in that fans are going to be interested in and want to watch and listen and talk about the team. Um, I don't think that's going away anytime soon. And I think, you know, they have done a good job at making sure that there are guys there that can put asses in the seats like Fernando Tatis Jr. You know, and he listed off the the, the guys yesterday. We don't need to, to rehash it. Um, that being said, though, yeah, man, I, I would love to see the roster completed before pitchers and catchers report. And then let's ride. Let's go. Like, hair on fire. Let's. Let's try to shock yeah. some people. You know, I don't know if the Padres will be good or not this year. That remains to be seen. But I've seen not good and not interesting Padres teams. That's the worst combo. The and, not interesting teams and at all. I can tell you that I don't know if they'll be good or not, but there, there's going to be interest, interesting things surrounding this Padres team. You know, enough talented players, uh, enough excitement that at least it's not the old days of, all right, they're bad and they're also boring. boring. Right. And that is not that is not true, I don't think. So um one, I mean, if for a team in need of maybe an off season win, you know, one that had so many off season wins the last couple of years and, and not many this off season, I thought yesterday was a big off season win for the San Diego Padres. Let's check traffic, then we'll talk about uh, what we did right after the show yesterday and why the Padres think uh, yesterday could be a game changer for their organization coming up next year on ninety seven three the fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Considering we've got some very wet roadways around the county, folks aren't doing too bad. Just a couple things to mention here. Hit and run crash northbound side of the 125 just past Hamishaw. It's already in the clearing stage. Also eastbound 8 near Magnolia. We have reports of a collision involving several vehicles. Looks like it is partially in lanes. And southbound side of the 805 at Orange Avenue off ramp. Collision involving a couple vehicles there over to the right shoulder. Yeah, just continue to give yourself plenty of extra time. Keep your speeds down out there. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. So it's been a, a couple of years now where we've kind of heard about um, the Point Loma Nazarene University Biomechanics Lab and the plans that the Padres had. But, uh, you know, it's a slow process of designing the facility, you know, getting the funds, construction, and everything. And finally, yesterday, uh, after a lot of work on behalf of uh, both the uh, the university and the Padres, they were ready for the official ribbon cutting of their new biomechanics lab, uh, which is on a satellite campus, actually just down the street here from, from our station. And we got invited uh, to take part in that ribbon cutting ceremony to hear some of the speakers from the school and the Padres and then actually go in Woods and and see what it looks like in there, where Padres pitchers like you, Darvish, who was in attendance yesterday, uh, will get up on a mound with cameras all over the place, sensors in the floor, you know, that actually measure force and instantly. Like, I mean, what is amazing about it, they had Daniel Camarena there throwing some pitches and how quickly, like instantly, you don't just see the velocity and the spin rate, but you can actually like see the skeleton of the pitcher, like his entire movement. The cameras are so precise that you can see as the ball is being released out of their hand, exactly where their finger position is on the seams it's and pretty riveting, how the ball man. comes out. It's, it's uh, pretty, it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. It, it, it really is. And, and they had a, a kid from PLNU uh, throw first and, it was fun, man, to watch him kind of get hot up up there. And he was I, first pitch was like seventy nine. I went, oh okay, and then eighty three, eighty six, eighty eight. And I'm watching the the ball come out of his hand and the pronation of his wrist. And I just was, I was just entranced by it. I think it's really really good stuff. Um, you know, I think I, it, it serves a dual purpose. A lot of pitchers get hurt because of mechanics. And when the mechanics go, it's like anything, man. If you're able to repeat your golf swing, you're going to be a good golfer, right? And if you, when you lose it and when you chicken wing and when you leave the face open, you're not. 
If you can repeat it, the guys that can repeat their swing over and over and over, those are the best guys. Same thing with pitching mechanics. You want to be able to repeat your mechanics 100 pitches, whatever you're, they've got you slated for. And to You say it to yourself without even realizing it. Like If you're on the mound throwing, whether it's adult league, fantasy camp, yeah. high school, college, whatever, you're like, oh, that one felt good. Do, do the same thing. Do, don't change a Whatever thing. Whatever I just yeah. did, that I got, felt really good. I got to repeat it again. And so it can actually help uh, limit injuries by you know, making sure your mechanics are in line and your foot's landing where it's supposed to be and your arm's where it needs to be. And uh, Then the other detail of it is why isn't my slider breaking? You know, well, where's your hand on the seam? Where, you know, where are you? Where are you snapping it off? Where it's all of that, and it's really, really cool to see. So you're only getting this many RPMs. Yeah, you I'm excited. Ideally, want this many. I'm excited to see how many guys buy into it. And it sounds like, based on the article Dennis Lynn wrote in the Athletic about it, Dennis, we saw Dennis yesterday. Uh, it sounds like a lot of guys have already bought in pretty heavily to it. A lot of guys have already gone in and gotten their assessments done, um, which is great, which is great. It was really cool to see. The so I'm excited about question it. question I had was it's all it all felt like very cutting-edge technology. When they were explaining the cameras and how many cameras are in that room, is this cutting edge for the Padres? Like, are they leading the game with no. this, or are they behind the game? I would say or? I would say they're caught up now. Well, no, I mean, I get the understanding that I got. Obviously, like out places of the other twenty-nine places, teams in baseball who has this kind of technology. Places like Driveline, who are the the cutting edge of this, this puts the Padres near the top. Not, it's not catch up. Uh, what I was told is that this is going to. They are now like the envy of other teams. Okay. Like they are being asked by other teams how they put it together. PLNU is being asked by other Major League Baseball teams. Like, how can we set something like this up? This is beyond just TrackMan. Right, which everybody and, has. Um, Rapsodo and Edgetronic. Uh, this is this is a, a next level to Good. that. Is So this Good. is fairly... This is fairly cutting edge and something that I think puts the Padres a little ahead of the curve. Now, how long does that last? Are you ahead of the curve for five years? Are you ahead of the curve for two years? Curve Other for three teams, weeks. Yeah. once they see, they get jealous. They start trying to catch up really quickly. But hopefully uh, this puts the Padres in a good place. And one of the things that, as I understood it at least, that is really going to help, and you mentioned it a little bit, Woods, is trying to minimize pitching injuries. It's... It's like the final frontier because for a long time, injuries were simply something unlucky that happened to your team and there wasn't much you can do about it. But now, um, for instance, take Joe Musgrove and when he got hurt in spring training last year. So you can go in to the Padres facility and they had the mobile facility before. Now they have the, the full physical facility, basically get a baseline like, okay, this is what your best pitches look like when your form is perfect and you know, you're getting your best velocity, your best break, everything feels good. So when you're maybe coming back from an injury like Joe was, you go back in and you test your biomechanics and to make sure like you're not compensating anywhere for an injury that is changing your delivery that could lead to more of an injury. And before Joe Musgrove got the green light to return, he had to pass Basically, the biomechanic screening going, all right, are you throwing like normal or are you doing something that's going to cause an injury? And they said, looks good. Matches what we've seen before. Your mechanics look good. You're ready to come back. And in the in the long run, the Padres are hoping that by monitoring this closely, they'll be able to minimize some of the injuries that are caused by poor mechanics, by altering your mechanics, because oh, maybe you have a a hamstring tweak, and that's changing your, your push or your land, which then affects everything all the way up the kinetic chain. So, you know, if this keeps guys a little bit healthier on the field more, that can be a real competitive edge in Major League Baseball. Yeah, and the other thing I'm, I'm really interested to ask uh, T.O. Rubin when he joins us at 835, we'll be joined by Padres pitching coach Rubin Diabla, is the discernment that he has to have when working with a, a bevy of different pitchers because I think the younger generation of pitchers will be like, oh, give it to me. Give me all. I need to know what my spin rate is, and I need to know this, that, and the other. Uh, they did talk about yesterday in the presentation about the the head coach of PLNU was talking about, yeah, you know, I, I get the info, and then I got to figure out how to disseminate it. And I want to ask Ruben about um, you know, how that kind of works at that level, the very top level that you can be. 
How do you know when to give somebody more information? How much is is paralysis by analysis? Like that's a that's a dance that you have to have as a pitching coach, regardless of technology. Like there's always there's always the dance that you have between. 15, 16 guys that you've got under your, your command. You're right. You can't just say, well, we need you at uh, 2,800 RPM right. here, and we need you at 98.4 miles per hour. Right. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to confuse a lot of people if you just throw a bunch of numbers. But um, I heard you, Darvish, talking a little bit about it. My colleague, Jeff Lasky, did an interview with him, and I could even see it. So when they slow down those cameras and you can see just like just the slightly different releases on pitches yeah. – and and Ruben talked about how if guys can see it, it sometimes you know clicks in like oh when I when a pitch really worked when it broke well I did this and it could be just as much as like you know just a slight thing but you can so see it so clearly and if they know okay I know what that feeling is I got a little bit a little more under it there or I got a little less less under it it can really make a difference for guys having that visual aid to repeat their pitches the way they want to. I mean, there's nothing like it. We used to have to do air check meetings at our old station with no audio. <laughs> I mean, like, just, just tell me what I, you're telling me what I did wrong, but you don't have the audio to back it up, so I'm just supposed to take you at your word. Yes. Would that have been helpful to, for, to us to grow as a show? Yes. Do you have the audio of that? No, I don't have it. But trust me, you did trust this. Trust me, you did. All right, well, see you guys tomorrow for our daily meeting. Of course you need and want the evidence of, of what you're doing. If you're going to train me on something, you know, you can't just walk by and go, you got to get that arm up on that changeup, right? No, you got to show me. Show me, because I feel like I'm doing exactly what you're saying. Well, no, look how low your elbow is, right? Like, it's going to be great. And, 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 and again, yes, it, this did exist, and they, they sent you know players to the James Andrews lab in Alabama, or some guys would go on their own to driveline. But now the Padres have the ability to do this in their own backyard, which is undoubtedly much, much more efficient than putting someone on a plane across the country. You might be able to do that once a year. Now you can check in through the off season and and you know other even parts of the year and i'm curious to ask ruben when he joins us at 835 how much during the season can you use this yeah, like good, can you good question. like a pitcher between starts will he maybe do his you know his bullpen session and go to this lab instead of doing it at petco park when they're at home just to occasionally get that you know that baseline or that comparison to where they were before or is this more of an off season tool for the Padres and, and how they specifically plan to use it going forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited about it, and it was nice to go and, and see yesterday uh, how it all shapes up. There's They can also analyze uh, position players' movements, you know, your 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 movement to the ball. There's a hitting lab there as well, so it's going to be hopefully really beneficial the for these guys. They got the whole tunnel, the batting practice tunnel, and they can have a pitcher versus catcher or a versus hitter yep. in any ballpark in America. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Simulated like a golf games. simulator for baseball. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty cool. All right, like, so, oh, that would have been a double at Yankee Stadium, but not at this stadium. All right, one hour in the books. We'll come back, play take on Woods, and are the Kansas City Royals trying to be the new San Diego Padres? Yesterday's big baseball story coming up next here on 97.3 The Fan.
So the Kansas City Royals taking a cue from um, what Peter Seidler did here with the San Diego Padres as a small market baseball team. Welcome back. It's Ben and Woods, hour number two here on a Tuesday on 97.3 The Fan. You really do make the San Diego connection with everything. It's actually an incredible, incredible. Well, there's a lot of San Diego connections talent. here. Uh, look at <laughs> it's, a, it's a skill. Look at the offseason the Royals have had. Oh, they yeah. signed uh, Michael Waka, yes. former Padre. Yes. Seth Lugo, oh, yeah. former Padre. Oh, yeah. Hunter Renfro. Former Padre. Did they sign him too? Yeah. Yeah, they got Hunter Renfro. Um, let's see. They just uh, signed Adam Frazier, former Padre. Good God. They are the Padre. And now. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and now they have uh, offered and signed to an 11 year, $288.8 million contract extension their young, exciting, promising shortstop, Bobby Witt Jr. Their. Fernando Tatis Jr. of their organization, as it were, to lock him up for a decade plus, like the Padres did with Tatis to the 14-year deal uh, three years ago. Now, we'll really know that they're copying us when they move him to right field next year, <laughs> and he is a, a platinum glove winner. We're like, hey, something's afoot now, here. Now, they haven't gone out on the giant free agent market and done the uh, the Manny Machado and Xander Bogart signing. They're still the Kansas City Royals, and, the, and they may not be... Uh, fully in with the let's see if we can increase the payroll to the uh, you know the level of the top five teams in baseball. But uh, clearly, the Padres, AJ Preller, Peter Seidler were on to something when they identified a young potential superstar player and thought, let's let's take care of this early. Let's go with the long term contract that may look ridiculous at the time. A comp- almost you know unproven player getting three hundred and forty million dollars for that amount of time. That's that was it was nuts. Uh, people viewed it as as completely unnecessary. Why you could wait a little bit? Yeah. Why would you do it so early? And you're gonna you could regret this. Of course you could, and you still may. But now other teams are seeing the value in with the way that baseball salaries just continue to increase. Fernando Tatis Jr.'s deal. In just a short couple of years, all of a sudden looks like a bargain. It, it absolutely a, pote- a it, real potential it, bargain. Twenty four a year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, with Otani getting seven hundred million now. Yeah, for a superstar player, and if he is anywhere near what we've seen so far for a decade, the Padres will be reaping the benefits of that deal for a long time. Soto's next contract will probably be the more appropriate comp. I mean, you can't compare anybody to Otani's double. It'll be contract. double at least, I think now. But yeah. you can't you can't compare to Otani. Yeah, the number is what it is. But yeah. the guy's a uh, never before seen two way player, right? But Soto getting four fifty five hundred million. That's still that's more comparable to Tatis now as another outfielder. And you're like, yeah, I'll take Tatis at twenty four million a year. One Absolutely. Of the, one of the differences I've I've seen in the two is that I don't see the national blowback. Um, with the Kansas City Royals signing Bobby Witt Jr. to this deal. I love Bobby Witt Jr. He's from my hometown of Colleyville, Texas. My brother went to Colleyville High School. Uh, the Witt family grew up there. I love Bobby Witt Jr. This is not a knock on him. I have not seen any blowback uh, on on this deal at all, like we did with the Fernando Tatis Jr. deal. Uh, Ken Rosenthal, in fact, who is... You know, it's kind of a low-hanging fruit, easy target sometimes. I mean, he wrote the article yesterday. Rosenthal, Bobby Witt Jr. extension shows small market teams can and should make big moves. When two weeks ago he wrote that they shouldn't because they might end up being a pedophile like Wander Franco. And then he had a lot to say about the Tatis deal when that happened. So I don't really know. It's very much snip, snap, snip, snap, back, forth, back, forth. Like, is it good or is it not? Is it good? I think it's good. I, If I was the Royals brass, I'd say, absolutely. Are you open to this, Bobby? You are? Great. Then let's get this thing done. We want you here, and we want you manning shortstop for the next 10 years, 11 years. Absolutely want you to be a Royal for the rest of your life. Now, he's got opt-outs. Yeah, that in the, does, in that, the seventh, that does eighth, protect and him year. a little bit if protects there's him. Uh, if he's like, uh, you know, an unbelievable superstar. And he's like, this, you know, we're not winning, and this is terrible, and I want to win before I go. Then yeah, he's got an option to to get out of there if he wants to. But I thought this was an awesome move, and I thought it was a necessary move. Am I? Do I also understand they're bucking for a new 
Stadium to be built in Kansas City. Is that I right? I think they just decided that they're staying. Are they going to stay? Yeah, at, and they're going to they're going to re- refurbish. And I thought, they, I thought I read that they were still working on. Are it. they still thinking about it? Potentially. Uh, I well, know. I know a lot of people would like them to stay. They love Kaufman. I loved it. I had the time of my life. It really was one of the nicer, cooler stadiums I'd been to. I thought Passon wrote something along the lines of like to start his story yesterday. Uh, the Royals are hoping that to get a new stadium soon, okay. and that Bobby Witt Jr. will be the centerpiece of it oh, okay. or something like that. He's a spectacular player, man. He is a spectacular player. I love watching him play. Uh, but yeah, it's I loved it. I thought it was great. I think it's great for the game and for all the reasons we just talked about with like Tatis being a bargain. You don't the market changes so much in just a short span. I mean, when guys like Sean Manaya are making whatever fifteen million a year, guys that you, you completely forgot about, like that's on the pitching side of it. But I look around baseball and you look at like what the Mariners did uh, with. Um, their center field. Julio. Rodriguez. Julio. Yep. You know, signing him to that long term deal. Yep, Twelve year deal. You're seeing prospects getting yeah. six, seven, eight year contracts. The, the guy now. Jackson Chorio just Chorio. got eight years, eighty two million dollars from the Brewers. From the Tigers. Yeah, I, I I think it's great. And hey, listen, don't be surprised. You know, don't be surprised if if Ethan Salas continues to climb the ranks as he is. Uh, that you don't see a deal like this in the next two to three years for the San Diego Padres of locking him down for ten, eleven, Maybe twelve even years. Sooner. Maybe even sooner. You never know. I am uh, I'm accused in the chat of being a little jealous of the Royals. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I might be a little jealous of the Brewers as well. They made a move yesterday that uh, that I liked. Um, let's get into that first. Uh, the phone lines are open for Take on Woods. We're about three minutes away from our game. So if you want to get in now, this is your chance. Nobody on the line. 833-288-0973. Chance to qualify for our new Las Vegas getaway and tickets to Air Supply. In concert at the Westgate, but uh, you need to beat or tie Woods in our game coming up. Musical Trivia Challenge, 833-288-0973. Call now. We're going to play in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, the uh, the other move in baseball yesterday was uh, maybe under the radar, but the Milwaukee Brewers, who just traded away Corbin Burns, of course, to the Baltimore Orioles, signed right-handed pitcher Jacob Junis to a one-year $7 million deal. And, uh, you know, Junis didn't. Corbin Burns. Yeah, I was going to say, if you, if you worked in Milwaukee this morning and tried to pitch this, they would come after your head. No, but uh, <laughs> he does, and I saw Eno Saris come out with some of his stuff, and his slider is is definitely one of the best in the game. He showed the Stuff Plus numbers on sliders, and Junis was right up there. I think it was in the top 10, top 15 in the league. Uh, one of the top ones in the league, I noticed, was Michael King as well, new Padres pitcher with one of the top sliders in all of baseball, but if you're trying to find, I mean, you're never going to replace a Corbin Burns completely, but to trade him, the Brewers obviously would like to still be competitive. Sure. Uh, it's certainly a winnable division that they've gotten to the playoffs several times in recent years. They make it harder on themselves by not being able to keep star players, but I thought a nice, you know, a temporary, yeah. you know, stopgap move to replace. Corbin Burns and someone that, you know, I, I'm looking for the Padres still to add one more stop gap type pitcher. Were there details on seven million? Uh, seven million. One okay. year, seven million. Yep. Yeah. I mean, but again, it's, you know, Jacob Junis is not some star player who has consistently put up, you know, great numbers. He's got some good stuff, though. He projects, he had a career seven war, 0. 0.8 last season. That's not star, but three three point eight seven ERA, four and three, you know, in 86 innings. It's um, these are the kind of players that I would think the Padres would be looking into at least you know going into spring training and they needing, may be. needing to add. They may know. be. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what they're what they're up to. No, no, they have uh, played it close to the vest. Very, very close to the vest. I mean, you can't get much closer to the vest. You're like you're in the inside. You no, know, you're, you're inside. inside you're under vest. your shirt, peering through. Oh, two kings. Yeah, you're, it's up under your shirt. You really don't want anybody to see it. All right, uh, let's uh, get to today's game. It's time to play Take on Woods. All right, we got Tom as our contestant as uh, Woods leaves this, the studio. Tom, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're good. Uh, first timer or have you played before? First time caller. All right. Love it. Let's go through the rules. I'm sure you know them, but just for everybody. It's five questions, musical trivia. 
Uh, Woods will then come back, answer the same five questions without benefit of the category. If you beat or tie him, we will put you into our grand prize monthly drawing for a two-night stay at the Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino and two tickets to Air Supply May 31st, June 1st at the Westgate International Theater. Tickets are on sale now at Ticketmaster.com. And, of course, Take on Woods is brought to you by Valvoline Instant Oil Change. Only takes 15 minutes. You don't have to get out of your car. For directions and discounts, go to SoCalOilChange.com. That's SoCalOilChange.com. Here are your categories, Tom, for a Tuesday. Still have the mystery category sitting there. Uh, that one, the uh, the first song, the two-second song, will give you the clue to the rest of the answers. We have Don't Call Me Edward. That is all about musical eddies. And we have a new category called Add a Zero, in which you're going to add a zero to each answer all the way through. So your choice, mystery category, Don't Call Me Edward, or Add a Zero. Tom, what is it going to be? Let's do mystery category. Ooh, Why not? It's back. All right. Um, the mystery category can be tough, but if you identify the two-second song, And the artist, you'll be well on your way to solving today's mystery category. So, Paul, going to play you some music. Give me the title and the artist. If you don't know it, say pass. You may figure out the category later on as we go. Uh, You'll have 60 seconds to answer as many as you can. If you don't know, say pass. We'll come back to it if there's time left on the clock. Tom, you ready to play? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. The mystery category. The music will decide. 60 seconds on the clock. Your time begins when Paul plays that music. Good luck, Tom. Let's take on Woods. I never meant to be so bad to you. Uh, I think it's Eddie Money, but Pat. Which 1980s song that became an international sensation turned the Vapors into one-hit wonders? I really think so. Uh, Pat. The title of which Led Zeppelin progressive classic shares a name with the northernmost province of India near the Himalayan mountains? I got no chance here. Pat. It didn't become popular until David Bowie recorded it in 1983, but which song did he co-write with Iggy Pop that was first recorded back in 1977? Uh, Pat. Murray Head is the British actor who raps out the verses in which quirky song from the musical Chess? Goodness gracious. <laughs> oh, no, Tom. Pat. All right, go back to our song. so bad to you. One thing I said that I would never Oh, God. That's okay. No, you know what, Tom? It's all right. The mystery category can be very tough. Got to get the first one. Yeah, so that song is Heat of the Moment by Asia. And Asia was the theme because the rest of the answers were Turning Japanese by The Vapors, Cashmere by Led Zeppelin, China Girl by David Bowie, and One Night in Bangkok by Murray Head, all Asian places. So, I don't know. Maybe this will be tough for Woods, too. We had a 5-4 game yesterday. Yeah. All right, Woods. Down goes Woods. All right. uh, Let's reset everything. 60 seconds back on the clock. Your time begins when Paul plays the music. Good luck, Woods. Let's take on Tom. Heat of the moment, Asia. Correct. Which 1980 song that became an international sensation turned the Vapors into one-hit wonders? I really think so. Um, I'm turning Japanese. Correct. The title of which Led Zeppelin progressive classic shares a name with the northernmost province of India near the Himalayan mountains? Kashmir. Correct. It didn't become popular until David Bowie recorded it in 1983, but which song did he co-write with Iggy Pop, first recorded in 1977? Um, that is uh, Fame. Incorrect. No, it's not fame. Murray Head is the British actor who raps out the verses in which quirky song Ugh. from the musical Chess. Putting on the Ritz? No. You got three. Which What's is... the Bowie one? China Girl. China Girl. I didn't know he wrote that with Iggy Pop, actually. Yeah, it was a mystery category. He did. Uh, Asia was the theme. A- Asia, Heat of the Moment, Turning Japanese, Cashmere, China Girl, and One Night in Bangkok. I hate that song. But uh, you did win Head. today. Three, nothing over oh. time. It's a mystery category, which is always tough. That is very. That was very tough. Yeah, Murray Head. By the way, that song's terrible. I know you like it. I, <laughs> I do. know you do. I know it. You didn't have to tell me. I knew you liked it. I do. Bangkok, Oriental City. It's the worst. The worst. One night in Bangkok makes the hard man humble. Whoa! My goodness. All right, let's uh, let's try again tomorrow with another game of Take on Woods. Congratulations on getting back Thank into you. the win column. After an L to guy yesterday. All right, don't do this is coming up next. You said you had a uh, 
Matt Barnes story. Oh, dude, come on, man. Yeah, you went full Little League dad. And we, have our, uh, dad. we have our first controversy from Super Bowl week in Las Vegas <laughs> already involving... Another one? The San Francisco 49ers. Oh. All right. Coming up next with Ben Woods on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
All right, two stories that make you shake your head. A little do-do this to wrap it up. It's our traditional 720 segment, and we'll let uh, Woodsy kick us off this morning. Hello, Woods. Hello, my friend. Uh, Former NBA forward Matt Barnes went full Little League dad at his son's high school basketball game. He was standing, yelling uh, obscenities at the referee. And then, this is where it gets interesting, he allegedly attempted to intimidate a student broadcaster. Uh, So... Jake Lancer said on the air, Harvard Westlake broadcaster, that Matt Barnes came up and kind of put his hands on me, actually. Um, Lancer said he was fine. Uh, But Barnes had been going onto the court multiple times to yell at the the officials. When the two made eye contact is when he approached Lancer. He said, what do you think you're looking at? And I said, you're screaming you're a P word to the refs mid-game while I'm trying to announce, don't touch me. And then he said, I'll slap the S out of you. This is a kid, by the way. He's like 17 years old. He's like the the Ben Higgins right. of Harvard-Westlake over there trying to call Which a basketball Which is pretty big-time high school basketball. Yeah, absolutely. In, in the L.A. area. So another video posted to uh, Twitter was also captioned, student told Matt Barnes to shut up, right? And he said, I never said anything like that. He came up to me. All I wanted to do was get back to announcing the championship game. So Matt Barnes... <laughs> goes to Twitter and says to a uh, woman on Twitter, shut your ass up. I was talking to the ref, not you or that kid that decided to say some slick ass. Don't let that privileged HWS, uh, Harvard Westlake, S, go to your head. I don't give an F who your son is. And then somebody followed it up with a video. It says, caught in 4K, buddy. It's all on video. I mean, you can very clearly see him lose it at a basketball game uh, that his son was playing at. You know, that's an interesting question. If the uh, kid is broadcasting the game and what Matt Barnes is saying is being overheard, I think the kid has a right to be upset. Now, as a 17-year-old, can you ever can you ever call out an adult? Do you believe that? I know there are certain people who just believe that kids should never, never call out adults, even if they think they're wrong, that that's not their place to do so. It's disrespectful. Uh... If he did actually call him out, say, hey, 17? Shut up! Shut up! Even if it's Matt Barnes, like I don't I'm, think he said, shut up. Well, I don't know what he what what he said, but should he not have said anything to Matt Barnes? Let other people handle it because he's just 17. Or does he have a right to say something if he feels like, hey, I mean, this guy is being disruptive, and I'm I'm doing this broadcast, and what would you have done? I probably would have just tried to plow through it. And yeah, we know. Not said anything to Matt Barnes. Yeah, it can but- be an intimidating. Yeah. Fellow, for sure. Matt came up. And what would Ted Leitner have done? It's a good question. It's a really good question. I think we know <laughs> I heard what Ted Leitner would have done. a concept. Bite me. I heard him lose his mind on Saturday calling the uh, Utah State game because the coach, Danny Sprinkle, of the Aggies. Danny Sprinkle. Would not, would not stand anywhere except right in front of Ted the entire time. <laughs> I would do the exact same thing. Coach, can, coach, can't you just move over here? I can't see anything. I can't call the game. I can't call the game. Like, I can't see. It's incredible. He lost his mind. I love it. I love when he, he loses lost his, his mind. mind. I have a lot of love By for the way, Teddy and me. We got a little Teddy coming up Yeah, here we do. In a second, and do do this. But Matt uh, Barnes, Matt Barnes, number one, like, let the officials call the game, right? Don't go on the court. We get it. You're a big NBA star, but don't go on the court. Don't start calling the referees P worth. You went full Little League dad. You know, it happened, and, you know, wear it. Uh, and and accept your accept your punishment. All right, had our first Las Vegas based controversy of Super Bowl week on uh, day one. Essentially, had the uh, the media night last night at Allegiant Stadium. But uh, before that, the San Francisco 49ers had their first practice. They have been assigned UNLV as their home practice base for the week. So they are using the UNLV football team's practice fields. UNLV though has uh, field turf, and they decided. That's not what they wanted to practice on. So the NFL installed like a sod, a grass field above the field turf, temporary for the for the week for the 49ers to practice on. But apparently they just put it in last week and the 49ers aren't too happy with the quality of said field. Now, Roger Goodell has said it's it's fine. We've had 23 (laughs) experts go check it out. The union signed off on it. This is fine. There's no story here. There's nothing to nothing to see here. Yeah. Um, The 49ers, though, said there's certain standards. There's a hardness score for fields, and every field in the NFL is at least 70. It's, like, pretty pretty firm. You don't want guys sinking into the grass, essentially. And they said the field that they're using is in the 50s. It's, like, pretty soft compared to 
what everybody's used to. Now, maybe they're being soft by <laughs> complaining about grass that, that sinks a little bit too much, but the last thing you want to deal with is an injury or no something doubt. like that this week. They're going to deal with it. Um, you know, well, trying to move past this story, but it's I was reading on something ESPN, that was talked about yesterday. Says the NFL put in a sod field on top of the field turf and started laying it just last week. The NFL ordinarily requires Super Bowl practice fields to be done and meet the standards back in December. Holy smokes! Like, they just did it. Yeah, last one week. week's pretty pretty quick to try to just put a grass field on something. You gotta have time to let it kind of settle and the seams to all meld together. A week isn't a lot of time. Man, when I see what my beloved San Diego Seals play on, uh, the, the turf that they play on at Pachanga Arena with bubbles and, and folded up corners, and then you go to the backfields of Peoria, Arizona, and you take ground balls on that, the way I look at it is I'm like, no one should complain about anything. You guys are, you guys are pro. You'll be fine. You know, you'll be fine. Find a giant ballroom to practice in in Las Vegas. I'm sure there are plenty. You know what I'm there saying? There probably are football-sized ballrooms There's no in Las Vegas about. to practice they're, they're, in. They're going to be okay. Um, I got the last one. Just made me laugh yesterday. I saw this tweet from uh, the, the great. Mega doo doo. The great Ted Leitner, who we just mentioned. I wish I could do his voice better, but I'm not going to. It's a GPS breakdown trying to get to the Madres' 50th anniversary dinner. Stopped at the Brigantine to get directions. Manager Andy Thimes says, I'll drive you there. And then you call me, and I'll pick you up later. <laughs> Saved by a Padres fan. So the dinner, the dinner wasn't at the it brig. It was not at the brig. <laughs> but Ted knew how to get to the brig. He, and he thought saw maybe the someone, brig. Someone at the brig will know where I, I'm supposed to go. I absolutely died. And not only did they, they said, Uncle Teddy, I'll drive. You. I'll just take you there. Thanks to Andy at the Brigantine and the Madres. He said, Saved by a Padres fan. I thought that was the greatest story. <laughs> Imagine you're, you know, you're Andy from the Brigantine, and Ted Leitner walks in all in a panic because he's lost, and you're like, you know what, bro, leave your car. I, I would have done this exact same thing. Like, I'll just drive you there. Uncle Teddy showed a, a great, you know, a lot of trust in, in Andy from the Brigantine to get him there. Uh, it, but I thought that was just a really, really cool story, and, and very uh, quintessentially Uncle Teddy. And Polly on our feed showed a great picture of my colleague uh, Marie Coronel, who was there at the Madres dinner. Posing with Uncle Teddy and Jesse Agler and Mud Grant, all at the uh, the Madres anniversary dinner. So that was very cool. And that is Don't and Do Do This for a Tuesday. That was Don't Do This with Ben and Woods on 97.3 The Fan. All right, uh, we'll come back. Uh, new prospect rankings are out. I almost what It's almost embarrassing this? to say I know. this. What I know, just, this? just to keep... Keep bringing them up. It was Keith Law who had his uh, his top 100 in the athletic yesterday, but he's higher on one particular Padre than any other list. Keith, and uh, Keith has done this in the past. He has. He's done this in the past. It's an interesting. It's an interesting uh, dichotomy that he presents, uh, and he's done this on more than one occasion. We can talk about that as well. Coming up next with Ben Woods on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
We're just one hour away from uh, Padres pitching coach Ruben Niebla joining Ben and Woods for just the second time ever. Looking forward to that conversation. As uh, I mean, Ruben was so important in you know AJ Preller's mind to the franchise that uh, he <coughs> was me, he was locked up before they hired Bob Melvin, correct? Yes. And now that and when Bob Melvin left, it's like no, but we're we're keeping Ruben for sure. No matter who we hire as our new manager. Ruben is sticking around. They want him to be a mainstay of this organization for as long as possible. Yeah, I, I think that's that goes without saying. He came in here with uh, rave reviews from everybody that worked with him before in Cleveland. Um, yeah, my hope, Benny, is that he is a Padre for the rest of his career. And he is watching him uh, yesterday at PLNU and listening to him speak as well. Uh, that dude knows exactly what he's talking about, and guys really, really respond to him. And you saw what he was able to do uh, last year, helping guys like Michael Walker, helping guys like Seth Lugo. Um, you know, I think it's 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 a, a lot of the times it's dependent on the player as well. You know, you're not a magician, you're not an alchemist or anything. Like the guys got to want to do the work and learn, and they do under him. I, I think I think from a standpoint of uh, some of the staff that A.J. Preller has put together, Ben, I honestly second to none as far as Ruben and his squad go. Um, I'm looking forward to our conversation with Ruben and getting his thoughts on some of the new pitchers. So he said he has seen 26 different Padres pitchers already coming through the lab. So he'll have a good idea of, of what he's got to work with this season, even before pitchers and catchers report to Peoria, Arizona this Sunday. Yeah, some guys on the roster, some guys non-roster invitees, uh, I think is, is what I read. But, yeah, if you get a chance to go work with him, absolutely, you take it. And I, I love to hear that 26 guys have already done that. All right. Um, I know we've we've had a lot of prospect talk this off season, but it is fun to dream on the potential of – uh, you know, future maybe superstars. And uh, Keith Law of The Athletic is extremely high, even higher than uh, most on one Padres prospect in particular. Get to that right after this check of traffic on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Traffic is sponsored by the Ahas Casino and Resort. Yep, this is another day when it might be a good idea to work from home if you can manage it. But if you got to get out there, guys, give yourself plenty of extra time. We've had numerous spin-outs. Got one on the Murray Ridge on-ramp to northbound 805. Also collision on northbound 15 before Market Street. You got middle lanes blocked there. South Five Coastline got a vehicle that spun out, wound up in a ditch over the right shoulder right before Santa Fe Drive. The daily jackpots at the Ahas Casino and Resort are on fire. Players have hit huge wins with bets as low as 50 cents. Check out their jackpot winning smiles on the Viejas Facebook page. Want to join them? Who knows? Our next jackpot winner could be you, Viejas Casino and Resort. And Kelly Danik with Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3, the fan. So it's prospect ranking season, and everybody who uh, who does this has come out with lists in the last few weeks, uh, including Baseball America and MLB Pipeline and uh, ESPN. ESPN. Uh, so you've seen a ton of these, and they're all kind of variations on the same theme. You know, there some guys will make the top 100, others won't on certain lists. The you know the top 15, 20 are generally the same guys for the most part in a little different order. And we've seen Ethan Stalis jump into all of these rankings after last year. I mean, he wasn't even eligible yet; had not started his pro career as a 16 year old who had just signed um, out of Venezuela. But this year he is eligible, and we've seen him climb into the top 10 in certain rankings, number 9. But Keith Law of The Athletic uh, released his rankings yesterday, and he has Ethan Salas all the way up at number 3. Ooh, hard not to get excited about number that. Number 3. That's, um, that's, a, that's a very excited Keith Law looking at the potential future of Ethan Salas. And uh, here's what he wrote a little bit that will have you – have you kind of wetting your appetite about what Salas could bring? So he's a smooth catcher who has game calling experience and is comfortable catching premium velocity already with a plus arm and quick release as well. At the plate, he's surprisingly short to the ball for a six foot two hitter with easy power already. He has enough pitch recognition that he has an idea of when to reach back for a little for a harder uh, reach back a little for a harder but longer swing. Catching's tough on the body and mind with prospects behind the dish essentially doing a double major, learning all of the skills for a backstop, receiving, blocking, framing, throwing, game calling 
calling being nice to umps, while also developing as a hitter. Salas is advanced at the first major, being a catcher as any 17-year-old I can remember seeing, and he seems to be ready to at least survive in double A as a hitter already. It's a potential that would potential bat that would play at first base attached to a catcher who might be plus in every meaningful aspect of the position. If he keeps hitting, Krylon might put him in their commercials. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means I either, but Krylon I bet it's is. good. Yeah, sounds good to me. Sounds very good. That's as me. glowing of a, a scouting report as you're going to hear about just about anybody. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's funny. And I he he lists his criteria for for how he ranks these Krylon guys. Krylon is spray paint. Paint in the corner? No. no. Hmm. It must be some campaign that we're unaware of. Yeah. Potentially. So he lists. Oh, is that Johnny Bench's? Was that that's what Johnny Bench used to oh, do the ads for spray Krylon spray paint? Is that there right? We yeah. figured it out. The next Johnny Bench. That's. I think that's what that reference was to. I got that reference. Big shoes to fill. Um, <laughs> the interesting, the interesting God, thing like that Captain America with a Wizard of Oz reference. Oh, I got that one. I got that one. It's very old. No right. idea what you're talking. Very about. old. It's like Andy Griffith's show. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Just we'll just saying stuff. And it's like all in the family. And cheers. <laughs> Very much like cheers. What Keith does is a little bit odd to me. He's got his top two guys are ready to make, you know, they're expected to probably play this year. And that's Jackson Holiday, Jackson Churio, a couple of Jacksons at the top, the uh, Orioles and Brewers, respectively. But then he's got. He's got Ethan Salas at three, and way down, not way down the list, but down the list a little bit is, checking in at number 23, Jackson Merrill, who's probably the, the prospect that is is closest to the big leagues, I would imagine, for the San Diego Padres, at least on the position side. But there's no imagine. reason to ever think that a pro, just because a prospect is closer to the big leagues affects their overall, their overall ranking, ranking of what kind of prospect you think they are. Now, it's weird that number nine, Evan Carter, is in there, but he has a World Series ring from the Texas Rangers last year. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like there's Paul Skeens, Kyle Harrison pitched really well for the Giants last year. He's in, in – Everybody has their kind of rules yeah. about how much service time you can have while still be classified as a prospect. Yeah. And even winning a World Series doesn't necessarily no. make you a better prospect. Now, it's – much harder to project a younger guy who's 17 years old. Which is why I would have put him down maybe, not nothing against him, but guys that are probably more ready to make the stand, jump. Stand by your evaluation. You know, if you look at a, a position like catcher and a guy like Ethan Salas who stands out so much compared to other catchers of his age – I can certainly see why Keith Law would make that argument that you're not going to get much better than this. I mean, the, I've heard, uh, you know, Pudge Rodriguez being compared to Ethan Salas in terms of the advancement, like, like what he looked like as a 17 year old. No one's been as advanced since like Pudge at this age. Yeah, he made his debut pretty early. He's, I as think, well. 19, 19. Is, is when he made his debut, and there's talk. And he was immediately, when he got there, he was, that's, that's, Impact he player. was incredible. There's talk that, um, that Ethan Salas may even beat that. So if he comes up in 2025, he would come up likely as an 18 year old. Yeah. Um, you know, if he comes up early in the year, because he will turn, he will turn 18 this summer. He's 17, will turn 18, I think. I, sometime around August or something is when his birthday was. Because he remember he played like four or five games as a 16 year old at Lake Elsinore and then turned 17 uh, this last season. So now he'll play a bunch of this year as 17 and turn 18. But if he comes up June first in, in June first, so even earlier. So if he comes up uh, in 2025, it will likely be either as an 18 year old or a 19 year old. And there's a lot of people who think he can absolutely make his major league debut in 2025. Man, he's got to you know. It, He's got a hit, and and that's what Keith says is is that he can survive at Double A. That's the thought. Um, I did hear Jim Callis on with Quinn and Chris yesterday saying it was pretty insane that they moved him up to Double uh, A last year. But then again, man, like getting experience is is not a bad thing. It doesn't. What's the? Let me. Ask I, I think you this. that's overblown. It was nine. It was nine. Nine games. games. What's the? What is the harm there for nine games if, to bring if, a guy if, up? If you had brought him up for like three months and he was just just struggled just and, and outmatched by the pitchers yeah. and you lose confidence, that's that's one thing. It, for nine games as part of a playoff run to be part with other guys. And by the way, everyone said he may not have put up big numbers, but it doesn't didn't look like he didn't belong there. 
when he was at double A with the other guys. You know, he wasn't hitting quite against the double A level of pitchers, who, by the way, are generally the top yeah. pitching prospects. The top guys in a guy in their system are going to be at the double A level. Um, so, you know, facing the best of the best. But yeah, I thought the most of the reports we heard last year were very good. It's going to be fun to see where he starts the now, season this year. Paul, did you say you saw a prediction that someone thought that he might even come up in September this year? <sighs> it was it was uh, ESPN's bold predictions, so not something that they necessarily really believe will happen, but something that they think could happen, at least on the outside realm and, of possibility. And I don't remember exactly who wrote it. I think Alden Gonzalez and Kylie McDaniel wrote a couple of blurbs for the Padres. One of them was that Jackson Merrill would get called up before the All-Star break. Okay. And the other one was that Ethan Salas would be a September call-up for the San Diego Padres. Not because they need him, not because they really even want him to play, but for the same reasons that you just talked about with him getting that promotion last year, it would be getting that major league experience, getting yeah, the life of a major league baseball player, getting coached by the best, et cetera. We're, you know, the Padres have been pretty good about – not manipulating service time. That one to me would be a little bit insane at the big league level in September. It's not the 40, you know, you don't get to call up 100 guys like you used to and just have a guy. You don't want to start that clock, I guess, if you don't need to uh, for a, he'll be just freshly 18, a few months, few months uh, past his 18th Does birthday. Does that start his clock? Yes. The September call up the, the, would, would count as min, a year the, of the, service. It, it, a minute. It, uh, no, the, it goes day by day, though. You but, don't get like a full year of service. You, you right. get maybe like 10 or 15 days. You, now, don't, wanna, you don't want to start he, that if clock he then if you was, don't have to. If he was then on the team to start the next year, you might get him closer to Super 2 status for arbitration in a couple of years. But if he's that good, you're gonna extend great, him. that's fine. I mean, you, yeah, know, you're you probably might think of anyway. extending him. Now, one thing that, and I can't remember who brought it up, and this is um, this would be in the category of really good problems to have. But what if Luis Camposano goes as a monster season this year as the generally everyday starting catcher for the Padres? And, you know, the best that we saw from Camposano last year was was quite intriguing. And, you know, his hitting ability continues to improve behind the plate and has the potential, I would say, if things go well this season, to put himself squarely in the upper half, maybe, of catchers in baseball. Yeah, he's, you know, ranked, all, he's ranked lower lower third right now, uh, preseason rankings and all that. I saw something the other day. Uh, but, yeah, if, if he's able to do that, Benny, move up a couple of notches there, you're a top 10, top 10 catcher in the league, which is he absolutely has the potential to do that. Um, Obviously, he's got to stay healthy, yep. which is has uh, been a challenge for him so far. It opens up a uh, whole new can of worms for A.J. Preller, which, again, those are worms that you're happy to have. Uh, again, yeah, probably too early to really speculate, but at some point you'd have to consider position changes and trades. And, I mean, it's a, it would be a very valuable commodity to have a productive, everyday Luis Camposano at the big league level and Ethan Salas pushing his way up quickly in the minor league level and then trying to figure out what you're going to do with your riches at a position that most teams are fairly poverty at. And by the way, we don't talk about some of the other Padres catching prospects, but uh, they've got a, a few they guys a few. down there that, yep. that these experts are fairly high. I'm not top 100 guys, but certainly catchers that – at every level now that that other teams would be going like god i wish we, i wish we had some of the catchers the Padres had in their minor league system so it is they a, can be yours for the low low price of a excellent excellent corner outfielder perhaps maybe a some, center uh, fielder a starting pitcher starting pitcher perhaps the low low price uh you know and i don't know that the teams are I mean, there are probably some teams out there that are looking to build their minor league catching system. Most are looking for someone who's going to compete, contribute pretty quickly on the major league level. It is the position that's the hardest to fill, both in major league baseball and on your adult league team. Do you, are you catching? You have uh, a catcher? I'm catcher rich. You're catcher rich? I'm, I'm laden, really? Catcher You're like one of the only yeah, adult laden. league Our managers. Position. Catcher rich. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I know what I'm doing. So I, I knew exactly who I needed to target and I, and I got them. I got Michael them. says, here goes Ben again, trying to trade our good players. Yeah, <laughs> Ben trying to trade Ethan Salas today. I didn't say Shocking. that. Shocking. I could be trading Luis Camposano. I'm shocked. <laughs> Absolutely shocked. <laughs> I'm, 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 in, I'm speechless. <laughs> no, it's it's a good it's a good problem to have, you know. Except when they're all at shortstop coming up, <laughs> it's a, you know that's that's been kind of an issue. You can't have the massive log jam there, uh, but 
Yeah, at, at some point, man, you can't hang on to all of these guys forever. But Ethan Salas is one that feels a little bit like the golden goose. Like you're not, that's not one that's going to be, that's that's a non-starter uh, for any trade talks, I would imagine. It, it seems like the organization is really, really high on him. And we can ask we can ask Ruben Niebel about him as well. I know he's worked with him, I'm sure. Is there any desire, and, and again, don't even know if there's been conversations <laughs> lately, but now that uh, Kyle Higashioka is part of the team as a backup, Gary Sanchez remains in free agency, unsigned by another team. Is there any desire to to get Gary Sanchez back as a designated hitter bat and potential injury insurance back up at a catcher position in case Luis Camposano goes down again? You wouldn't necessarily feel too good about Kyle Higashioka and Brett Sullivan as your only major league catchers for an extended period of time. You know, I wonder uh, what the plan is with Gary Sanchez. He had a really, really nice resurgence with the Padres and really found his power stroke. I don't know what he's going to command, Ben. I mean, if you're talking a couple million bucks, yeah, no brainer, gotta no brainer. You got to do it. Uh, can DH for you, but he was one of your is he gone? very I, few bright spots. So, Guzzinator says, didn't he go to the Pirates? I saw they were rumored to be interested in him, but I don't know that a deal has been consummated yet. I did not see that, but uh, I don't believe he signed anywhere, which means it, it's still fair game if if teams are interested. And, and the- I really, I, I really liked. I was anti getting Gary Sanchez here, and he showed me. I was so happy to be wrong uh, on him. I loved seeing what he did last year for this team, and it seemed like such a natural fit. Um, let's see, Angels labeled as a fit for two time All Star by MLB dot com. Uh, Pirates rumors, Gary Sanchez still. Um, yeah, Pirates and Angels are the two teams attached to him right now. It doesn't sound like the Padres are really in on him. I mean, we talk about, obviously, the outfield spots and some pitching depth. You brought it up yesterday. I think Paulie made a promo out of it. Designated hitter is not somewhere that the Padres are at all in good shape, especially with the news that Manny Machado is progressing well and could be back at third base by the start of the season. If he's healthy, he's at third, which puts you know Xander Bogarts, Hassan Kim, Jake Cronenworth, Jake Cronenworth in your That's infield. Your infield. And you you still don't even have a complete outfield, so you can't take one of your outfielders and make them a, a designated hitter, which leaves what? Kyle Higashioka, Eggy Rosario, Matt, Matt Batten, Batten, Jose Azokar. These are not designated hitting options that you want to be choosing from. They no. need another bat, too, that's not just an outfielder, but someone who can just plug in and give them some uh, some designated hitter at bats as well. Yeah, I, and again, I just I have not. It's been so tight lipped, man. I have not heard the Padres really connected to uh, anyone, but that's usually how it goes. Typically, when they are connected to someone, they don't get them, and then they get somebody that surprises and, you, like Wandy Peralta. And when Eric Gruppner said and went through the prospects and said, "Hey, the youth movement is coming," you don't want any of them to really be the DH, though. No, you don't want to, you know, hamstring a, a young player by then not letting him play the field once they bring him up. So I don't really consider, other than in an emergency, anyone like Jackson Merrill to be a DH right. coming up. That's the last option you want to do for a young player early in their career. Couldn't agree more. So you need someone Somebody. out there to DH, and I just thought maybe Gary Sanchez. Another right-hander, of course. Of but course. Beggars can't be choosers at a certain point. All right, we'll come back. we got two hours to go. Ruben Niebla will join us in our 8 o'clock hour. Uh, much more coming up with Ben Woods on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
All right, my friends, we are halfway home on a Tuesday that definitely feels like a Wednesday, maybe even a Thursday here on uh, Ben and Woods. That's why we have different opens every day. I know. The four-hour Just show keep is... track of the days <clears throat> now. The four-hour show is feeling like a six-hour show uh, in this very, very slow off-season. But we will persevere. We are together. We are here. And uh, that's something. I always laugh because people think, oh, it's Super Bowl week. You guys must, I mean, sports radio must be huge. (laughs) Super Bowl week's the worst. It's the worst. It's the worst. It's the worst. Unless your team's in it. There's two weeks between, it's one football game. It's one game. It's two teams we've already talked about for a month already. It's one football game. The yes. overanalyzation of this game is enough to make your head spin. By the way, I'm Woodsy. That is Paul Rindel. He's the executive producer. Ben Higgins, your friendly neighborhood sports anchor, uh, joins us as well. You couldn't be uh, more right. It is the over. Even I like on the national championship game. Yeah, I think I asked on the air. When is the kickoff going to be? And you're like six thirty six. I'm like, I, I'm tuning in six thirty four. I cannot do. 19 straight hours of coverage. I don't know how those guys do it. And they stay on those desks and cover that one game all day long. And this guy, and he's going to be the pocket passer, and he's going to quick release, and, you know, the comeback routes. and blah, like there, There's the literally nothing dumber in sports, I think. And there's a lot of dumb things in there's sports. There's a lot of dumb things in sports. Then the media day, the opening night, they call it now, that all they right. did last night. Terrific. I saw the pictures of I didn't even I didn't cover it at all. I was I, I'm so tired of it. The pictures of the media mob surrounding Travis Kelsey's table. Yeah. And you see I mean, it's like 14 people deep and there's someone I mean there's like people in the back who are holding their cell phone Selfies. up yeah, the self- to get what a little video or a shot of Travis Kelsey over the heads of 17 other people but they can't possibly hear anything he's saying or ask a question or anything what content is that whose content is Adam would love all it. right here's what we've got for you we've got a blurry picture of travis kelsey adam would love it and post it on 97.3 <laughs> the fan uh page remember the do you remember the chris paddock picture oh god yes that yes. he posted the press Hashtag photos yeah. by adam it was it looked like it was taken with a potato i'm a bad photo taker too but i, I won't even try most of the but time yeah, because what's the what is the What's that content? Travis Kelsey is there answering questions. You're 50 feet away from him with 100 people between you and him. I think it, you know what, honestly? Here we are at the Super Bowl with Travis Kelsey. The psychology. Thanks, what the does psych- that do for anybody? The psychology of it is, oh, I'm going to get my phone out. Like, all right, here's a perfect example. We went yesterday to the PLNU biomechanics lab, right? And I was sitting on the bench. I was pretty close. I mean, I could I could hear the ball whistling out of the guy's hands. Paulie was right there. Our buddy uh, John Hoover was sitting next to me. And we're watching this guy throw. And my natural reaction was to get my phone out and start recording a video. I didn't post it. Like, I didn't. And then I thought to myself, why did you do that? If you didn't have any intent of, like, posting it or if it's. Because you know what I knew? I knew that 700 other people would post it yesterday, and I didn't. So uh, tell me you found that picture. It's on there. It's on, it's on there? It's, yeah, it's on the YouTube stream. The <laughs> taken with the potato <laughs> picture of Krell. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a... It looks like something Bo drew and colored in. That was on the 97.3. Is it a watercolor? I got to tell you, I used to. <laughs> For those of you listening, I'm sorry that you can't see it. It's a picture of Chris, Hatt- Chris Paddock. It's so blurry that if you didn't know it, he had the mop of hair behind him, you wouldn't know it was him. Um, but when we were at the other station, I used to just rip at him. For the social media here, it was it was my favorite topic. It was like the most amusing thing I'd ever seen. Adam would tweet out a graphic of Eric Hosmer starting at short, Fran Mill Reyes on the mound, uh, Austin Hedges in right field, and I would die. I would just retweet it and laugh every day. They were so mad at me when I got it because I was poking fun at them because, well, I mean, if you're going to do it, try to get it right. But, I mean, as he, you're asking who would want that content. He sits right down there. He just popped in to say congratulations. He would want that content. I'm surprised you didn't make like Sammy go out to freaking Radio Row I know, a I week know. before. He, hey, just go to on Vegas. Way, then on your way, pop over, Chris, pop to over. Vegas, down to Peoria, oh. and get us some uh, Super Bowl Media Day content from opening night. I'm telling you, like, I'm not good at it. 
So I just try not to post a lot of content like that. Big fan of the retweet. I'm a big fan of the retweet really good content and make my own snarky comment on top of it. That's really my wheelhouse. All right. For uh, legal purposes, I'm going to pause for a moment. Okay. Now I'll tell you, big game coverage on 97.3 The Fan is presented by Solo Stove. Feel the heat of the world's most popular smokeless fire pit. Visit them today at solostove.com. All right, back to our regularly scheduled programming anyway, so now. so the Super Bowl, what a lame week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be a good game. I think it's going to be a great game. I can't game. wait but to watch the today game. Today is Tuesday. The game is on... Sunday. Sunday. It is too much, man. It is too much. And between much. now and Sunday, it's going to be a slog We've got to get a, there. What, I don't even know what channel this is, but we're watching Vegas Sports Insider Network on TV in the studio here. And they're, it's, they did it all day yesterday, all day today. It's the we're worst just, content They're of just here. looking at the, the lines. It's, it's plus two. It's, it's the My, worst. It hasn't changed. Nothing has happened. It's the worst. And they're going to do content. this for three more days, and then they're going to have weekend shows on Saturday. Oh, but you know, have, like, daily coach press conferences in which they are asked the very same questions by the same reporters every single day. Andy Reid will will say something. Kyle Shanahan will. Say nothing. I mean, it, it, it'll happen every single day. Then they'll do it on Friday where they're wearing suits at the big official coaches' yeah. press conference when they'll ask, they get the same questions that they got the previous days. It is the most redundant, overplayed, pointless week of the sports calendar <laughs> by far. I mean, like by far. But the game should be good on Sunday. The game should be spectacular. Um, the national championship game. I mean, that, like, those are the, that's what you live for. And I'm sure it's as big of a slog for those guys as it is for the the, the viewer. I, I do want to put myself in their shoes. I mean, if it's a game seven for the San Diego Padres, I mean, Adam Clue, he doesn't even have any hair. He would grow hair. He would be so, like... Yeah, but that's like 48 hours max yeah, after yeah, game that's six. Right. After yeah, game it's six, probably it 24 hours 24 after game hours, six. But that's you'd, fine. You'd get nonstop. That's non-stop fine. You'd be breaking coverage. down game six. You'd be looking into game seven. We've already done all that with the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's true. You, you've, you've had a week already to talk about this matchup. Do you think they should just go Yes. the next week? The next day. The next day! <laughs> Oh my God! We just won the AFC. We're going to the Super Bowl games tomorrow at I'm noon. Hop on a plane. Yeah. It's it's the reason they do it is not it's not logistics. They want they want the media coverage because they do. They get you know Derek Stevens from Circus Sports talking about their content, their product for an hour on TV right now, even though they're not playing anything. Yep. It's it's free essentially. They get free week of media coverage. The entire country gets to be obsessed with them. Why wouldn't? Why, they're probably thinking about maybe we make it three weeks and we just extend this thing another week of hype because it's, there's nothing else to talk about right Tony now. Tony in the chat says, yes, the Super Bowl is lame. We know. We, we're not saying that. The game's going to be great. I can't wait to sit my ass on the couch oh, and watch wait. this game on Sunday. Uh, on Sunday. Sunday. It's the Super Bowl hype and the Super Bowl week that is overrated yes. or lame no doubt there's no doubt about it uh changing gears just a little bit um you know we did it in the open wanted to say happy birthday to my son Bo again you know what he requested this morning on his birthday for his birthday breakfast two things craft taco not craft taco okay. i'll tell you about that in a second uh he requested waffles he wanted waffles and he wanted to watch white men can't jump <laughs> His favorite, like most six year olds, like do most six year olds do on their birthday, wanted to watch White Man Can't Jump. So that's what he is uh, currently doing. I'm going to scoop him up from school here in a couple hours. So, uh, if you're looking for some food, maybe for Sunday, uh, don't do this. Was brought to you by the Craft Taco in Sorrento Valley. The Craft Taco has some of the best quality tacos in all of San Diego. Go to the Craft Taco. Look at their happy hour specials today. The Craft Taco. Dot com. Did we have a tier one who was uh, tagging us at the Craft Taco yesterday? No, I yesterday? think that was one of the. the was that one of the yeah. actual Craft Taco people? Oh, yep. Very exciting! I can't wait to get out there. Have what not been there quaff? yet. Yeah. What is? <laughs> what is a quahog? What is a quahog? What is a quail? What is a quail? It's the best. It's just the greatest, greatest movie. That was one that you made me watch that I had not watched. I'm I'm blown away. And I did oh, actually honey. enjoy it. It was better than you, I expected. How did you, Joe Sports? 
<laughs> go through your entire life. I That's told one you. of the it's absolute a, it's best a, sports movies of all I, time. No I dismissed it as soon as I saw Woody Harrelson as a basketball player. I go, this is dumb. He's good. He, but he was good. He, he was, was much. He was better than he Wesley was Snipes. much better than I expected him to be. It surprised me. Billy Ho. That the basketball wasn't so bad as to be, like, make distracting for the movie and the all-time being... leading rebounder in pro basketball history still, still. Still. Gloria? who is babe ruth <laughs> no i'm sorry that is wrong richard or leonard <laughs> ruth? richard no, she's not very good chamberlain you are correct you get to pick again <laughs> babe ruth foods <laughs> that start with the letter q is the greatest it's the greatest she's the guys next to her looking at her and she's just cling 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 oh billy is so stupid uh, love it i love it yeah Perez. yeah I, I just it blows my mind that you never saw that one as much as you like sports <laughs> you're watching golden there's Girls. many sports movies that like what i haven't probably gotten did you watch friday night lights yes okay that was great Rewatched it with Bo last night actually although uh who was it that called me out oh wale called me out because <laughs> i have not seen uh meet the tight uh meet the Titans. remember the remember Titans. the titans, the titans? Oh. in so long i saw it like when oh, it first came out in the theater but i like haven't rewatched it once that's the Denzel. Is that the Denzel? Denzel yeah. is the I coach. I saw it one yeah. time. That's it. I saw it just that's the fantastic. one time. It's my favorite, but he like favorite knew all the lines. Movie. He was like, "How do you not know all this is sports?" I saw. I saw it once in the theater. It was good, but baseball movies far superior to basketball movies. Agree. and and football movies. I agree. I think, and I, it's not just because I'm a baseball fan. I think I, that's that's kind of you know, like that movie. Uh, what was the the Oliver Stone football movie with? Any what? given Sunday. Oh my God! What a horrendous piece of crap. Not good. I'll watch it, but it was a horrendous, horrendous piece of garbage. That movie, terrible. The the awful helmets with the chess pieces on them. Like, can we not? Like, even major major league found a way to use the when at the time the Indians and they had real teams in there. The like they had terrible, terrible teams. It's the, awful. I like uh, the replacements. That's pretty decent. It's funny, but it's also but pretty goober. They also too. have like the Washington Sentinels, yep. playing the Dallas Cowboys. Right, playing the Dallas I was Cowboys. Like, what are we doing? It's here? a very football movies are kind licensing of licensing is uh, weird. All right, here's a, f- a fairly hot take. Maybe you'll agree. I don't really like the natural. I'm with you. Other than the music, I it's like, not in I my like top that. five <laughs> baseball movies. <laughs> that I like that part, but it's a bit. It, it's a little bit slow. Slow, yes. It's, little, it's slow. It's a little slow. The baseball scenes are great. I'll tell you this, though. Robert Redford, not that great a swing. No. Not, not that great no, a swing No, the cutaway when he hits the home run, it's not even close <laughs> no, to believable. No, it's not that a great actor. It's not even close. Uh, Tim Robbins looked like he never threw a baseball in, in Bull Durham, <laughs> but it works for but some it was reason. Because it was funny. It was a funny movie. It made it work. Yeah. Kenny Powers, he's found out, couldn't throw a ball. They said they trained. They tried to train Danny McBride to throw a ball for months, and finally they just said, forget it. Like, <laughs> it's forget like, it. Major League's a comedy, but the baseball's pretty good. The baseball's pretty good. damn good. Pretty in, good in Major League. Yep, hundred percent. Charlie Sheen can can throw it. He can chuck it. Uh, and, Pedro uh, Serrano swing. Serrano could swing. Uh, um, Willie Mays Hayes, State looks Farm like, guy. He could he could swing it. He looks like he knew what he was doing. <laughs> it's great greatness. Great movie. The, that was good baseball. That makes a difference. It does. for me. It does. Me too. The, if the sports is not at least close to believable, it's distracting. Well, that's why White Man Can't Jump was great because those guys could hoop. I mean, and that's, really that's what shooter. surprised me about the yeah. movie. I just assumed oh, this, the sports are going to be terrible. I'm not going to like this. I'm trying to think of basketball movies. You don't see a ton of like bad at, like They look like they're hooping. That freaking Adam Sandler movie that they had on Netflix had that one guy that would look like the best basketball player I'd ever seen. And apparently he was like in the G Leagues or something. Yeah. He was. I was like, I've never seen anything like this. It was like Michael Jordan to me. <laughs> it was incredible. I know it's the movies. I can't remember the name of that movie, but it was pretty good. The Recruit or something. Um, but it was it was pretty solid movie. Love Coach Carter. Love Coach basketball. Coach Carter's great. Yeah. Uh, basketball movies are pretty solid. Football right. movies leave a little to be desired. All right, we got Ruben yes. Niebla at the, at the bottom of the hour. Uh, Aztecs have a big game tonight. When we come back, Brian Dutcher, is he uh, is he Lou Holtzing it tonight, or is there reason to be concerned about a game in which the Aztecs are double-digit favorites? We'll get to that coming up after a check of traffic. Do not go anywhere. It's Bennett Woods on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
Yeah, you know, I fully recognize the company I'm in in this room. I was looking at our YouTube chat. It was going crazy during the break with sports movies. Yes. Yeah. Thinking about football movies, there was one that just didn't do anything Don't for me. Say it. It's not Meet the Titans either. Yeah, Meet the Titans. I haven't seen that one. And Remember the Parents, <laughs> two of my favorites. <laughs> Whatever. I wasn't a huge fan of Rudy. Oh my God! Come on. What a what a story. The great Rudy Rudiger, against all odds. Come on. Ben, were you a Rudy fan? If that was about Ohio State. Doesn't do a ton on, for me either. Cared. Doesn't do a ton for me. I prefer Thursday Night Lights, the shortest yard. <laughs> yeah, Thursday Night Lights, shortest yard. Exactly. <laughs> Any exactly. given Monday. Yeah. It's <laughs> Monday. <laughs> Rudy was Rudy was fantastic. I keep asking Bo if he wants to watch it, and he doesn't. So maybe that tells you something. Because <laughs> I think it's on Netflix right now, and I, I'm like, hey, we should watch Rudy. It's about Notre Dame. He's like, no, I'm good. I've been to Notre Dame before. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine by me. It's why uh, you know I went to college. The same, the the place where Rudy was grinding it out, Holy Cross College. That's where I went. I also got on my feet there. Not did not get into Notre Dame, but you know, what movie football movie was. I probably terrible, but I strangely liked it. Was Draft Day? I loved Draft Day with uh, Kevin, Kevin Costner. Costner. And who was the uh, female? It was. Um, oh God! Why am I oh, it was. Uh, was Jennifer Connelly? No, no, no. Who um, was it? Jesus! Look it up. Somebody, somebody, uh, tell us. Why am I? Jennifer Garner. Jennifer Garner. Yeah, Jennifer it, Garner. it worked out almost too well though, because he oh, made a huge. I mean, all just, these. Perfect move. Stupid, stupid, it would never happen. Stupid move to start out with, and you're never gonna, you're never gonna dig yourself out from that bad mood. I mean, you're fired as GM. It's done, <laughs> right there. I don't know how he possibly extricated himself from that situation in that movie. Yeah, it was brilliant though how it all all worked out. Oh, TJ with an old school pool Wildcats with Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson <laughs> uh, back in the day. I think what he was in that movie, um, old school movie. Uh, do you ever see the one, The Best of Times, with Kurt Russell and Robin Williams? Just mm -hmm. incredible. Robin Williams did a sports uh, movie. He did. He was a receiver that dropped. Wow. He dropped the, really. He dropped the pass in high school that would have won them like this huge game. And his whole life, he can't get over the fact that he dropped. I mean, it hit him right in the hands. His whole life is he's haunted by this memory. He stayed in the same town. Kurt Russell was the quarterback, and uh, he. They recreate the game to get the moment. They they want to get the moment back, and uh, you know you can you can guess how it ends. Now I'm just trying to think so of like good. random actors in sports movies. Robin like Williams playing Matthew, a receiver. Matthew McConaughey was an outfielder in Angels in the Outfield. Was he really? Yeah, he's Didn't like the that. center fielder. We are Marshall is a great football movie. Ryan we'll Gosling was a mid cornerback yep. in Remember the Titans. That's right. That's right. Oh, I love that movie. <laughs> go go check. I think you'd like Best of Times. It's from our our era. I've never even heard of that one, That's so great. that was surprising. All right, um, let's just talk a little bit. Tonight, the Aztecs will play, put their num newly found number 24 ranking in the country on the line as they visit Air Force. And the, uh, the bad news with that is every time the Aztecs have been ranked this season, they've lost. Yes. Three weeks, uh, three losses each time uh, they've, they've fallen back out of the top 25. So they are favored by uh, about around nine and a half points I got tonight. ten, yeah. Ten, ten and a half. I've seen it right around there over Air Force. And Brian Dutcher was pretty clear. Like, we still consider this. if we It's a road game. It's altitude. It's Colorado Springs. We have to steal one. We go in. It's essentially an upset. You, now, they're 8-13. The Air Force they have, Falcons, and man. they have lost 11 of their last 12 games. They have not won a single home game in, in conference play. So they're definitely beatable. But what has Brian Dutcher worried and may concern Aztecs fans a little bit is the one win out of those last 12. It was two weeks ago. It was at UNLV, which is um, you know not at the top, but they're right in the middle of the conference, and they've had some big wins. They won by 32 at uh, UNLV. So they certainly have the ability on – a any given Tuesday to get really hot and make some shots and cause problems. And Air Force is always a tough scout. They do that slow down four corners offense that can be difficult, especially when you only have two days to prepare for it, which the Aztecs have only had two days, Sunday, Monday, to get ready for tonight's game. They did charter their flight to get there and have a little extra time practice yesterday, although I saw even the charter was delayed a couple of hours by the weather. So get there a little bit later. That can be 
sometimes the recipe for trouble on the road in the Mountain West Conference, but we talked about the formula for winning the league. You hold hold serve at home, yep. and you've got to beat all the lower-ranked teams in your conference, including San Jose State, Fresno State, and Air Force, and this is your only game against Air Force, and then you got to steal one or two against the top teams on the road. They haven't stolen any against the top team on the road, but they haven't lost against any of the bottom teams, and they haven't lost at home. So, so far, they're still there, but this is one of those games, like, if you lose, you can't really make up for it later in the season. So you got to win this one tonight at Air Force. Got to handle business. They're going all out, by the way, uh, at Air Force. Did you see? It? They're, they're tweeting, you know, pack the house tomorrow every, night. Every time the Aztecs come to any of these places. That's right. They it's, get the toughest environment possible. It is tropical night. Tropical night in, in Colorado, Colorado Springs, Springs in February. It is. A free food for cadets while supplies last and a tropical shirt giveaway for all fans. They're kind of dreaming on better weather at this yeah, point. Yeah, probably uh, being in Colorado Springs, but yeah, you know it's going to be. You know, you know it's going to. It's it's a road game in the Mountain West, Benny. You know it's going to be tough sledding, but um, that's a team that you should absolutely dominate. Dominate it is. even at altitude. I'm always surprised when Air Force has a decent team. This year, I think they're 244th in the net rankings, but they don't. They don't admit right. people who are over what is it, like six 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 or six seven because of the, the cockpit the, regulations to you know the size you can't really fit in some of the aircraft so there's certain height restrictions they have to to join the air force which means for a basketball team you're always going to be undersized in college basketball um, there's just no way to necessarily compete against the six ten, six eleven guys that you're going to have rebounding in other schools. So they are, they're always going to be a little bit behind other teams. But they've had some good years, and uh, they've got a good, good coach and a good team that's been around for a while, and they've given plenty of Mountain West teams problems over the years. They must win. Another must win. Or if you, if you to want win. to you win, prefer to win again. If you want to win the regular season conference title, it's a must win. And if you want to keep your record spotless when it comes to no bad losses they have no quad two three or four losses this would be a quad four i think even on the road maybe three or four for a team ranked this low that's a black mark on your on your record right now because the aztecs have zero black marks they're three and five in quad one games but undefeated in the rest probably going to get a five or a six seed if they lost one of these games all of a sudden you're looking more like an eight seed which then means you got to play a one seed in the second round. Even if you get through the first round, you'd much rather be a five or a six seed. You got to avoid losses in games like this. Sounds must winish to to help you in March and have a better road. What, what were the Aztecs seeded last March? Anyone remember? What were they seeded? Five, 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 and made it to the national championship. God, still game. had some tough ass opponents though. Well, you know, as a five, you got to play a one seed in the yep. third round, and they did, and they, they did. beat they Alabama. Won. But they also got helped uh, by some upsets along the way that they didn't have to face uh, a couple of the tougher teams. It was like a, an eight and a four seed or something? They got uh, the, the second round was an upset, so they faced, instead of the four seed, they faced the 13 seed 13. in the second round. And then after Alabama, they ended up against Creighton, who was like an, an eight seed, and then Florida Atlantic, who I think was a nine seed yeah. in the final four. So they had plenty of it help out along really the way. Well for the Aztecs. I can't awesome. wait for the picks. Make my my son pick them again, and he picked all the upsets all last right. year. Remember Let, that? Let's break because we got uh, Ruben Nablus yeah, scheduled buddy. to join us when we come back. About five minutes away, Padres pitching coach will be with us next on Ben Woods on ninety seven three The Fan.
Woods, why don't we just get right to it? Let's do uh, it. Joining us live right now on Ben, ben and Woods is the pitching coach of the San Diego Padres heading into his third season, the pride of Calexico, California. Ruben Niebla is with us here on 97.3 The Fan. Ruben, it's great to have you back on. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. Okay. It, Thank it, you for having me on. It was great to see you yesterday. I must say the uh, the biomechanics lab, the ribbon-cutting ceremony, and then getting to see exactly what uh, the Padres and PLNU have been working on over these past couple of years was very, very impressive. Just give me some of your thoughts on on yesterday and this new tool uh, that the Padres will have at their disposal now. Well, you know, we're excited about the partnership uh, with Point Loma uh, University. It's it, it's exciting to be able to say that we uh, can take some of our guys in there and get them uh, assessed and and look at their body movements and learn more about them. But I think most importantly is uh, being able to show the guys a little bit of uh, who they are and for them to have an idea of what they're capable of doing, uh, where their limitations might be, um, you know, what to focus on in the weight room um, to overcome some of these limitations. So it's pretty exciting, just the whole thing. I thought the ribbon cutting, um, you know, ceremony was awesome. Um, You know, the rain held off and, and we had a good time. You know, and I always wonder, uh, Ruben, like how there's because there's going to be guys that are maybe and I don't want to say resistant to it, but maybe need a little bit more pushing and prodding. And then there's going to be guys that, <laughs> that want to be in there probably every day, uh, you know, working on something and, and overanalyzing. How how challenging is that for you uh, to manage? Because you do have you got quite a lot of arms to manage. Yeah, no, I think uh, having a level of understanding of how the, you can utilize the lab is probably the most important thing. Is It's not something that you can, you know, just go in there and see changes happen immediately. Um, you know, there's, there's you assess your body, you assess your movements, you assess your kinetic chain, your ground force uh, reactions, and then you work on those. And then you continue to strive on getting to the mound and, and me as a coach uh, being able to cue that and say, hey, you know, in the lab, we would notice that your lead leg bracing was, was a little off. Let's work on that. Let's work on that in the weight room. And so you want to see, through time, you want to see improvement. Uh, a lot of the other stuff that was there at the lab, the track man use and, and the ability to, to uh, pitch design and stuff like that, uh, that we have at, uh, the comp- at, at Petco. Sure. So we're able to see that. Uh, we're able to do that there. And you know, it's it's, but it's almost it's almost uh, you know, w- one of those things where you know you do it three, four times a year, uh, and, and that should be enough. And I think um, educating the players on that is important as well. That's what I was kind of wondering about. Was obviously you've had a lot of pitchers coming through just in recent weeks, uh, and mm-hmm. getting you know recorded and have a baseline for what what everyone looks like. Will this be something that? You know, maybe once or twice during the season, a starting pitcher may go like, you know, their bullpen session. If you're at home, may go to PLNU just to, you know, see that everything's going okay or if there's been any changes since the last time they were there. Yes, that's exactly it. And ideally what you're doing is you're doing it at the front end of the season, which we just did here a couple of weeks ago. You you do it again uh, midway through, and then you do it again at the end of the season and see where you where you are at that point. And where that baseline is ending the season, whether you're able to identify fatigue or um, a lot of our pitchers ended up in a pretty good spot last year where they were pitching at at their best. And so you want to be able to use that as a baseline coming into spring training the next year. So once you get those baselines uh, covered, it'll give you a better understanding of two things going into the off season, what do I need to work on or going into spring training? What am I going to focus on? And then we can stay, keep tabs and, and keep players uh, lined up with to their goals. It really is fascinating stuff. Talking to Padres pitching coach Ruben Niebla here on Ben and Woods this morning. And, you know, you work for an organization and a GM that is constantly looking to improve that bullpen, uh, Ruben. So with every transaction that, that comes across, um, what is your kind of um, – process right so Padres go out and they sign uh, uh Wusuk go and so now do you go back and and dig through video do you uh what is your process when when the Padres add a new arm that you're gonna have to uh to get ready to, uh, to be up to speed 
So a lot of times uh, we uh, we're having those conversations internally before we sign them sure. about guys that AJ might be interested in. Um, he'll get the uh, opinion of many people, and a lot of times I'll, you know, want to um, or go. Let's say, for example, I knew that there was conversations and possibilities, uh, you know, before it happened, and so I had already dug into him, look at his uh, pitch usage, pitch metrics, um, just delivery where he's where he's failed, uh, where he's had success with what pitches, um, you know, the percentage of, of usage and. Uh, those are the things that you can just very easily dig into in our system. And then, you know, the, the big part is getting to meet him and, and, and talk to him and get to know what kind of person he is. And that that's the stuff that I'm really looking forward to coming into spring training. Uh, talking about some of the guys who came in from the New York Yankees who will be a part of the starting pitching mix, give us your thoughts on what you've seen so far from Michael King, uh, who seems like he's going to figure prominently for the Padres this season, and then uh, some of the other guys, Johnny Brito and Randy Vasquez, even maybe Drew Thorpe, uh, some of the newcomers, what you've seen already. Yeah, I've been uh, lucky to spend some time with all those guys already. Uh, I've seen Michael King uh, throw in the lab. I've seen him throw live um, You know, in our bullpen at Petco. So, um, you know, very impressive, uh, you know, person. Uh, you know, it seems like this guy's uh, going to fit right into um, to a leadership role. We're hoping that, he, you know, he steps in. And, and not to put that on him, but we know that he's capable and he has some attributes to be a, a, a leader. Um, you know, he's obviously had a lot of success, uh, you know, coming here in the bullpen. And we're looking forward to seeing what he's capable of doing on the mound and rolling lineups over and uh, you know as a starter it's going to be a little bit more more uh more challenges but it seems like he's uh he's going to be up for it um Brito and Vasquez are their their stuff is electric they got really good stuff those guys uh you know again our scouting department did a great job identifying some guys that you know have good upside and uh those guys are just uh showing showing their face into the the major league world uh, per se and and so we're also looking forward to seeing those guys and see what they're capable of doing you know with their opportunities now um you know it seemed like uh, when they were in new york it was it was getting opportunities here and there they broke into the big leagues as as relievers um got an opportunity to start but you know they've uh they really uh, it was out of default and so now uh they're getting a real opportunity here to come in showcase what they're capable of doing and and we uh we're we're going to be paying close attention to see what the how they can help us. And the same with Drew Thorpe. I mean that that guy was impressive. The numbers that he put up in the minor leagues those those are real. And uh, you know another guy that we're excited about. You know talking to Ruben Niebla here on uh, Ben and Woods this morning, Padres pitching coach. I saw how proud you were of Blake Snell and uh, Blake Snell is obviously a, a fan favorite, and you know certainly would love to have uh, a guy like Blake Snell back. What? What uh, what did you unlock in Blake Snell last year? Um, got off to a, a little bit of a slow start, and then you know, next thing you know, uh, doesn't let up a run for it seemed like six months. Wins a Cy Young. <laughs> I saw how proud you were of him. What uh, what were those conversations like? And and also, you take a lot of pride in that, and, and I'm sure um, that gives you a little bit of, of a chance to puff your chest out as well and say, yeah, you know, I, I helped him do that. But tell us a little bit about your relationship with Blake. Well, I, I think that's why, you know, you, you and I, I seem proud or I am proud. Uh, it's because because of the person that Blake is. I mean, he's a beautiful person. He's he's awesome. And so our relationship just kind of grew within time. And, you know, it, it, this year it was uh, it was a little bit different because he did get off to that to that uh, to that start where, you know, it wasn't something that we were expecting uh, the previous year. He came out. In spring training, if you guys recall, he had that groin injury, yep. so it took him a while to kind of get going. But he finished with a, on a on a strong note in 22. I mean, in the playoffs, he was uh, one of our uh, better pitchers yep. there. So, um, you know, this year he got off to a little bit of a slow start. And one of the things that I that I noticed in him is that you know a little bit of anxiety is when he would walk guys. It was there was uh, there was more conversation based around that. It seemed like after he evaluated his games with me. Um, you know, the next day that I was like, Blake, you know, you talk, keep talking about these walks. I go, but I don't see those guys scoring. 
And uh, as we know, I think it was 14 walks scored the whole year. Um, and so that's that's an incredible number. And so I think I think once that started happening where he was like, okay, I'm going to walk a guy. Yes, I get it. I understand that. But the key to this game is for the opponent to score runs. And that's what Blake was really good at. And he was the best in baseball at not allowing the opponent to score runs. And I think it kind of kind of relaxed him a little bit to be able to say, you know, even though he's at first base, it, it doesn't matter. Like, I, my stuff is still good enough to be able to get this guy out or the next guy out, or it doesn't matter who's up there. And so that was one of the things. I think another thing is, yes, there was there was some, some delivery stuff that we might, might have been able to unlock there. Um, you know, the usage was huge. Uh, bringing back the changeup, the usage of the changeup was huge. I think that was a pitch that really got him out of situations, out of trouble when he needed that pitch. If we look at the usage of that pitch, it was like, Three one counts, two zero counts, even three two counts that he was throwing it in, and he was getting out. He was having success with that pitch, and really um, ended up leaning on that pitch and finding confidence in that pitch. And I think those things are are what made it happen last year. But again, I'm I'm extremely happy for Blake, and uh, you know what's ahead of him, and you know hopefully. Uh, uh, hope it doesn't hurt us too much. <laughs> we, we remember when the changeup was in timeout. Oh, yeah. It was being, oh, it was yeah. being misbehaving yeah. and, and was being punished. <laughs> uh, Ruben Niebla is with us. Speaking of relationships, obviously Mike Schilt is not is not new to you or the organization. He's been around the last couple of years. But how, how does that change for a pitching coach with a new manager? Have you had some philosophical conversations and you know, anything that might differ from the way that uh, Bob Melvin went about uh, you know managing a pitching staff? We'll see. I think we are, you know, uh, you know, Mike and I have had numerous, a lot of conversations this off season. We've had um, many meetings where we've sat down and talked about it as a staff, as a group, but you, you don't really know until you get in the game and, you know, you start, you start, you know, seeing how he, how he functions, how he's thinking. Um, I know that, I know that, um, I prepare, I'm going to prepare the same way to be able to, to give suggestions on, on some of the matchups, um, you know, understanding uh, our pitchers and what they're capable of doing and, and, and possibly what creates the best matchup. But ultimately, it's going to be his decision. Uh, but we, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a different personality there. Um, and so I think uh, his personality and my personality match up a little bit more. I think there's a little bit more fire um, there, so it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be a, a a learning experience for both of us. But at the same time, I think it's going to be a good marriage. That's great to hear. Talking to Ruben Niebla here on Ben and Woods this morning. Can you speak a little bit, Ruben, about your relationship with the catchers? Because, you know, as you have to learn all of these pitchers and what they're capable of and get everything out of them, your catchers have to do the same thing. And and I know we all enjoyed the strides that we saw from Luis Camposano last year. Of course, Ethan Salas is shooting up the rankings of, of top prospects, and I know you've, you've talked to Ethan uh, as well. Talk a little bit about the relationship you have with those guys and managing your pitchers. Well, they're the uh, they're the coach on the field. Uh, you know, they've always said the catchers are the coach on the field. So, I literally treat them like that. I literally, um, you know, lean on those guys to be able to to manage a game, to be able to think the game, to be able to discuss uh, situations with pitchers. There's times when I literally pull the catcher and say, like, let's get this guy to do this a little bit more, and he goes and he takes care of that. And Austin Nola was the group was great at that. Um, you know, we saw that in Gary Sanchez, a uh, little bit more ownership. Uh, that we were able to give him, and uh, he he you know he took great strides forward. I think calling game, uh, but Camposano has been the one that you know a couple years ago um, you know I was like, whoa, he's he's uh, he's definitely a guy that has a lot of potential. This guy he is uh, it just needs a little bit more time and in, in, in getting back there and getting to know his guys and getting to know the game and and we do have a little bit of an attack plan that might be a little bit unique. Uh, compared to other teams, but um, you know, being able to teach what we what we talk about about effective velocity, about tunneling pitches, about attacking weaknesses, about knowing strengths, about knowing situations, that's the stuff that we talk about. And and Capisano has embraced that, and and, and he's uh, really really helped the staff uh, when he's out there. 
Um, and it, it's just a similar concept with, uh, with Solace. Um, that's the stuff that we're already talking to him about. And, you know, there's, there's something about Solace, though. He carries his, his, himself, um, you know, definitely not like a 17 year old. Uh, very confident young man, very smart young man. Um, and, um, you know, we're just looking forward for him to keep, uh, improving, keep learning. And, and when the opportunity is there for him, um, you know, we're, we're pretty confident that he's going to take advantage of it. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be exciting watching that young man play. Well, Ruben, uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, look forward. We'll see you out there. We'll be in uh, spring training in a couple of weeks. And so you're going out here in, in a matter of just days. I do have some bad news for you, though. I'm looking through. Oh, we got hundreds of people in our chat, and they're all going, this was fantastic. We need to hear more yeah, sorry. from Ruben Niebla this you're season. In, so now we're going to have to have you on a lot more this season. Just get ready for that. I know it's busy once the season starts. You're going to have to carve out some time for us. No, let's do it oh, anytime. Yeah, you guys. Hey, yesterday I got to apologize though. Uh, Woods yep. did want to get in on the Laval Mechanical Lab on the yeah, mound. He, <laughs> he was he was asking me bring in the righty, bring in the righty. Point he was my pointing own. at himself. Yeah. I really did need a, a Tommy John situation on my hands at that point. And I apologize. He wanted to show that. you his seventy-four mile an hour fastball. Ben, if a... I could throw seventy-four, I would be. I'd kick somebody in the face. Be able to throw seventy-four <laughs> yes. anymore. His sixty-three mile yeah. an hour fastball is what he really wanted to show off. Yeah. Well, maybe another time we can, if you can, car again, carve out twenty minutes. We'll get down there and get some work in. Thanks, Ruben. <laughs> Let's do it. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you, buddy. Ruben Niebla, pitching coach for the San Diego Padres. That's fantastic. We're going to awesome. react to that right after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Davick. Getting a little reprieve from the rain, but we are still left with some very slick roadways, a lot of flooding, a lot of closures due to flooding. Hey, if you're going to be in the Mission Valley area, do keep in mind Mission Center Road closed between Hazard Center and Camino de la Reina, both directions. Qualcomm Way from Camino del Rio North to Rio San Diego Drive and San Diego Mission Road from Fairmont to Rancho Mission Road, both directions. So, yeah, if you are in the Mission Valley area, just be prepared for some delays, traffic diversions. I'm Kelly Danick with Ben and Wood, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Ooh, a lot to get into. Uh, Ruben Niebla, I saw you uh, commenting that you are uh, extra fired up yeah. after hearing I'm, him talk. I, and, I'm back. I'm like, I'm just gassed up. Man. And, and again, if he came on and... Yeah, Michael King. Okay, He's all right. I mean, you know, new guys. I will see. You know, I, you're not. You're gonna get the best of the optimism at this point. It's February. Spring training starts in a couple of days. Uh, he doesn't sound like a big BSer though. No, no, I mean, that's true. It, 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 he didn't sound like he was blowing any smoke. You know, talking about the upside of some of the arms that are in the organization. And yeah, I mean, look, you you'd hope you have some. Some arms with some upside in the organization, you know, after everything that, that, that they've done and all the moves that they've made. Uh, I know he's excited to get his hands in the clay out there at spring training. I, I loved what he said about uh, him and Schilt. I love that answer. We'll see. He yeah, did. We'll see. He did notice how uh, how itching you were to get out and throw God, a I was couple dying yesterday. Dying to get on that thing, man. <laughs> dying to get on there just to see how ugly it. Re- my biomechanics, how crap spin they are. rates yeah. and everything. Have you you never thrown with a Mm-mm. a track man never. or anything like that? Never once. before. Yeah, it looked I could fun. Just see him. So what pitch was that? Oh, that was my that was, fastball. That was my heater. That was sixty one miles really? an hour, buddy. Yeah. You, you, That's all you got. Was that it a change like up? No, nah, that was his fastball. I love John Candy and Brewster's Millions. That was change up. No, that was his fastball. That's his fastball. All right, we'll come back. A couple more thoughts. Uh, Paulie's got some headlines in the Rindle Report. All in our final hour of Ben Woods next here on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
This Hour of Ben and Woods is brought to you by the Farmer's Dog. Our thanks again to Ruben Niebla, pitching coach for the San Diego Padres, who just uh, gave us a good chunk of time in our last segment and uh, got us hyped up for the start of Padres season coming up here. And as I said, I, I expected optimism, so nothing was, was too shocking. But one thing that stood out to me, Woods, is I was expecting the, the raving about Michael King and his stuff. When he described uh, Johnny Brito and Randy Vasquez and – and really kind of took some time to go, Those these guys, stuff, this is electric. He was very excited about those two. And, and I know they weren't just throw-ins in the trade, oh, that, yeah. they, that they're promising players, but I don't know that I've heard that level of, of excitement about those two guys in particular. It was always King and Thorpe, dreaming on the future on Thorpe, and King right now into the rotation. And the other two guys, oh, maybe, you know, they could be bullpen or starters. They'll compete for starting job. He was like... Now, these guys, they may be young and only have a, a, a little taste of the major leagues, but these guys have really electric stuff that he seems excited about. Yeah, it's 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 funny, too, because he said, he, he said essentially, you know, those guys got, they got a chance to start a little bit, and it was by necessity. But it sounds, again, I, and I think, you know, with, with more than one position on the San Diego Padres, Ben, I think there's going to be some level of competition. I, I People that are slotting in, you know, Avila and Matt Waldron into the four and five. I don't know. I, I think there could be there could be some su- surprises that come out of camp. And it sounded to me, um, you know, like Ruben was saying, no, here's a couple other guys that maybe we want to look at as, as stretching out to be starters. I could be, you know, talking out of my rear end. But no, uh, the Padres it, have said that both Brito and Vasquez are going to camp as as starters, as starters. to begin with. Okay. And, and it, that may change as uh, as needs change or as other guys compete and prove themselves but they will be getting starts or at least opening camp on whatever the path that starters are on you know like you know, two innings then three innings then four innings stretching out to to start games there is a confidence uh that Ruben Niebel has that I greatly greatly uh admire he's a man that knows what he's doing right he he doesn't waffle he has an idea and it seems like he's the kind of guy that you would absolutely die to play for. And I just wonder, you know, I wonder uh, with with Blake Snell, I wonder how much he'll lean on Ruben Niebla next year, wherever Blake ends up, right? Like, I, I think what he did for him um, after, you know, after a, a slow start and a couple of seasons of slow starts with the San Diego Padres, man, you, you do wonder if Blake Snell, if that's crept into his mind of like, man, I could – I could stay here and keep doing what I'm doing. I don't know that the Padres have the money to afford it. I wonder how hard it is for a pitcher who's had success, who then signs somewhere else as a free agent, and then starts to struggle. The instinct will be, God, I wish I could just call my old pitching coach. I'm sure you could. He works for another team. I'm sure you could. You could. but I'm sure it happens all the time. Bro, they used Does to said they said that Mariano if Rivera Blake used to show the giant, all the kid, all the if, guys the cutter in the, at the All Star game. Yeah, but he's if, showing Roy Halladay how to throw a cutter. That's a, that, I mean, that's a, a play their division for, rivals. That's a pitcher fraternity, though. This is a coach for the Padres. If Blake signed with the Giants, he was struggling early in the season, and he goes, "Ruben, my new pitching coach, it's just he doesn't understand me. I don't get it. Do you have any idea what's going on wrong with me?" And Ruben's like. Yeah, I've kind of seen the video. Do you say that or not say yeah, that to you an do. opponent? They're all, I mean, it's a fraternity. The, the, I all feel big like you don't. I feel like you don't. I think you do. At least you wait until the end of the season, maybe. You go, like in the off season, you I'll can talk say, to you in Here's uh, what November. I I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you in, in October or November after the season's done. But you can't, you can't say that one thing that may turn around an opponent. I mean, what if that is the difference that causes them to win two or three more games. I that, think you're overthinking a little I, bit. I can't. I'm not overthinking I this. This is are. sports. It's a fractional difference. Yeah, it's sports. But that's they do, this happens mm. all the time. All the time. All the time. It's it's They're the fraternity. It's not the, the laundry they wear, to be honest with you, Ben. It's the fraternity I, of I, ball players I dis- and coaches. I disagree somewhat. I know what you're saying, that there is a – there is a fraternity that goes beyond simply team loyalty at any given I mean, moment. But hey, if you you know winning a World Series, winning, going to the playoffs, all these things bring success and and riches and new contracts to players and coaches. And the other teams are trying to stop you from getting that. And during a season. Why would you do anything that might stop your own team and your own players and your own self, coaching staff, from reaping those rewards of success? 
Adam by says, helping another team. Adam in the chat says coaches don't do this. That would be undermining another coach. I mean, I don't think you I'm not go saying out of your I'm not, way. No, you know, to but do if, it. if Bla- like if player calls an him. old coach with another team, yeah, I think it happens said, all the time. Really, during a season? Yeah, I think it happens all the time. All huh. the time. I bet you it happens all the time in the big leagues. Ask, that'd be a good question for Tony Wynn Jr. to answer. I never yeah, played in the big yeah, leagues, uh, but, but, you know. And the same thing would go with, like, a hitter and an old hitting yeah, coach. 100%. And, yeah. um, uh, George kind of says it the opposite way. Like, when Ruben came here to San Diego from Cleveland, do you think Guardians pitchers that he worked with are still reaching out to him? I, I would say I almost guarantee, certainly. Does it make a difference if they're on a different, different league, different on a different league. side of the country, whether it's a team, like, in your division? Well, the other thing, too, is is you never know. You never know when your cra- cro- paths may cross again or I your mean, you're cross not, may I pass. I don't think you're, you're un, you know, you're not going to – mislead him with bad tips necessarily like yeah oh, this no. is this is tell the not, absolute wrong thing he's but, not going to call blake in on an off day no. and be like let's get you, let's dig in here no, no. but he's going to say no i mean you're rushing a little bit or you're you know don't forget you you got good stuff i don't know that you say anything if you're if you're for another team <laughs> i really don't ed says if i were in the end, i would tell him to f himself <laughs> hey go f yourself no, i'm not saying that i'm not it's not it's not it's not hostility just saying like i just can't i can't help you man i just I can't. You are so petty. And it's not petty. It's weird. It's, it's a little it's, petty. It's weird. Is it really? Yeah. And there's a lot of people in the chat who agree with me. I know. There's Landers. three people can't, that, that can't give the opponent you. an edge, no matter how small. Huh. Interesting. Um, the other. Speaking of coaches, the other thing that stood out, um, and I don't, I don't think this is piling on Bob Melvin after not- he's gone because I don't, I don't see any reason to do that. I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't blame Bob Melvin for last season, but Ruben isn't the first person yeah. who has pointed out a personality difference between Mike Schilt and Bob Melvin, and perhaps a more a fiery, more intense personality than Bob, who is now kind of being painted as the most laid back guy in the history of baseball in the Padres dugout last season. I don't think that was the case either, but. There's going to be some contrast this year. Yeah. <laughs> in the dugout with the manager of the Padres. Yep. I I I'm all for it. I mean, I've been I I was a big Bob Melvin fan. I am a big Bob Melvin fan. Um, but I think this team desperately needs a little bit of fire. Desperately. I mean, as desperate as desperate can be. And if Mike Schultz is that guy, I can't wait to see it. I cannot wait to see it. And hopefully it, it rubs off on some of his players as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, being a team that that has a little bit of an edge to it is a good thing. It's a good thing. And if Mike Schultz is the guy to bring that here, bro, I'm going to be the first guy on, on first guy uh, waving the, the banner for Mike Schilt, uh, if that's the case. And, you know, I, I just I loved his answers. I thought he did a great job. And Looking forward to seeing what he can do when he gets out to spring training. And, you know, you just hope everybody comes through spring training healthy and gives him the ultimate, you know, the ultimate package to work with uh, this season. Because I'll tell you, everyone keeps talking about, you know, all the innings that they have to replace. It's a real thing. It's a real, real thing. Losing Lugo, Waka, and and um, Blake Snell. Those are a lot of innings you have to figure out. Ruben's going to have to do a little bit of of goodwill hunting on the board. You know what I mean? To, to to get it all to even out. So the more arms he has to work with, the better it's going to be. Um, would still love to see them go out and get, you know, you mentioned Jacob Junis earlier, uh, somebody of that caliber of Hyun Jin Ru, something, somebody that can eat some innings. As we talked to Chris Rose a month or so ago about the, the Lucas Giolito deal. Yeah, it's at this point in the big league, sometimes they're like, can he eat innings? He can, great. Let's give him $14 million to go out and eat innings and hope he does well. Um, it's a valuable thing. Thing to have, and we only have really three guys, well, two guys that you can potentially count on for bigger innings this year. Paul, you're okay holding off on the Randall report for a couple of minutes yeah, here. Um, I thought his answer about your question on the bullpen new additions was interesting, and you know, part of the process that AJ goes through is consulting with <laughs> people, including Ruben, yeah. uh, before you sign a Wandy Peralta. And you kind of go through and and what you've seen. And, you know, Ruben, I'm sure Ruben doesn't have to sign off on any signing that A.J. Preller makes. But it sounds like Ruben, if he gives his stamp of approval, that's a big thing for A.J. Preller. And it sounds like Wandy Peralta is one guy who got, you know, the stamp of approval from Ruben Niebla as they were going through it and looked at, at the Pitchers coming over from Japan and Korea as well. Matsui, who was there yesterday uh, with you, Darvish, and Ruben Niebla at the Biomechanics Lab opening. You you mentioned 
Usak Go and looking at his, uh, you know, his film, his tape before they, they signed him from Korea as well. Sounds like Ruben was uh, intricately involved in all of that offseason process. Yeah, I like that too. It, it does give you the uh, the picture that it is a, a collective uh, working behind the scenes to to give Ruben the best pieces that they can under the, the current budget that they have. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to see how those guys shake out too and what he can do with them. I know. We didn't ask him about it. Um, I know Ruben did get an interview Oh, yeah. For the managerial job with the Padres as well. We'll ask him next week when he joins us again <laughs> after you pitched do you, him on it. Do you think that – do you see Ruben potentially as a future manager sure. in baseball? You yeah, do? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's not – not a ton of pitching coaches go that route. There are some. Buddy like Black. Bud Black uh, has gone that route. Uh wasn't Tommy Lasorda a pitching coach before he was the manager? I don't know. No, I, don't I don't know anything know. about Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> but – it oftentimes he seems like you go bench coach and then you rise, yeah. and it's not necessarily pitching coach to manager, but it certainly has happened. And you kind of can see with Ruben's personality that it feels like he could handle that job in the future at yeah, some point. I've seen a lot of Pottery fans say that. Um, yeah, I, I completely forgot that he had interviewed for the managerial position. Boy, you'd hate to lose him. Um, you know, and, and he's he seems like a, a guy in just a short time here that has really done an excellent, excellent job. A guy that everybody raves about, everybody wants to talk to. Um, he just has that thing. He, there's a thing that people have. Ruben has it. When he walks in a room, you go, oh, look. I mean, he's just got that that thing. He's got it. You know, and and uh, and has done such a great job so far. Can't wait to see what he does with this crew. I think you know it's gonna be it's gonna be tougher. It's gonna be tougher this year. Uh, but if anybody's up to the challenge, I think it's him. All right. Uh, sometimes I wonder how the Padres landed him. I guess uh, being from Calexico in this area helped. Daughter goes to San Diego State, so hel- I don't think that helped, hurt either. Helped helped wanting to come out here, but I bet the Guardians are still kind of kicking themselves for for letting him get away at some point. Where would you rather live? I Cleveland would probably rather be here, I think, here. Yes. would be my choice. Mine and yours both. All right, let's let's um, let's take a timeout. We'll give uh, Paulie the entire next segment for the Rondo Report. Uh, get some headlines. Are you going to do that uh, NBA story? Yes. All right, I thought this was very interesting. Some new technology, since we were already talking about baseball technology, a little new technology coming to the NBA as well, uh, part of the Rondo Report, which will come up after our check of traffic next here on 97.3 The Fan.
and get things started here with our edition, today's edition oh, of boy. the Rindle Report. Now tuned into the motherfucking greatest. Welcome to the Rindle Report with Paul Rindle. Hi, Paul. All right. Two stories from the world of sports that we haven't gotten to yet. We'll start off in Major League Baseball. And one story that you didn't know you needed. Are you laughing, Biot? It's the Rindle Report. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Okay, how are you? On 97.3 The Fan. Are you ready to bless the mood? I need some help, please. <laughs> that was good. Can I get a hoist? All right. All right. All right. Good morning, my friends. Good morning. I'm going to start off in the NFL. No Super Bowl news here, but the NFL is going to continue their tradition of playing international games. And it was announced yesterday that the Eagles are going to play as the host in the NFL's first regular season game in Brazil. And it's going to be their first game of the season. September 6th. It's a Friday. Against the Jags. Uh, no opponent. opponent yeah. No announced. opponent. It's the Jags. They always make <laughs> the, the Jags. The Jags already play They're two like, games what? in London. Uh, <laughs> so we got to go to London twice. Probably in playing in Germany. And yeah. we're going to open the season in Brazil. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, they're going to play in uh, Sao Paulo on Friday the 6th. I believe, yeah, the season kicks off that Thursday night. That's when they always do the first game of the year. That'll be awesome. It's going to be electric, I'm sure. Ever had any interest in going to Rio? Yes. Me too. Yeah, I would, I would go to Brazil. I don't know why, but I've always felt a strong pull to go see what Rio de Janeiro is I don't, like. I don't feel a large desire to go see an NFL game no. while I'm there. No, absolutely not. But otherwise, I'd be interested in Rio or Sao Paulo. Yes, as, I, as would I. Yeah. Why I, is I, that? It's exotic, different. Yeah. Southern Hemisphere, yeah. you know, the I'm toilets into, flush the other way. I think I'm into it. <laughs> when we were ki- when Ben and I were kids, there were a lot of movies about Rio. Every Rio was a real hot. There was a song called Rio by Duran Duran. It just Brazilian gave- steakhouses. Brazilian, yes, steakhouses. That's yeah. where I was going. A good uh, caprinha is that the cocktail that they have? Don't know. We have different thoughts about what is drawing us to Brazil, I believe. Yes, I believe so. So this will be... You want to go to Copacabana Beach? Is it all nude? I mean, outside of this country... It's mostly nude. Most beaches are at least semi-nude or topless. That's true. We are a little more buttoned up yeah. in this country yeah. when it comes to things more, like uh, that. A little more stodgy. But, yeah, you go to the rest of the world, it's not uncommon it's to see... <laughs> Naked people on beaches. I would like this show to be more freewheeling and less stodgy. Topless. Okay. <laughs> Topless shows. It's like we're in Rio. <laughs> When's that? Next season? Yeah, it's the yeah. first Friday of the season. First the Thursday night opener, which will be... be a home game for the Eagles. And so we already do know their home opponents based on how the schedule mm-hmm. and how everything worked out in the last season. So they will play. It'll either be against... The Dallas Cowboys, the New York Giants, won't be a the Washington game. Commanders won't, won't be, a be a division game. Won't be a division game. So it could be the Cleveland Browns, could Maybe. be the Atlanta Falcons, could be the Carolina Panthers, the Green Bay Packers, the Pittsburgh Steelers, or the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jackson, the Jacks. Do you know it? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the chat is saying, yeah, Brazil is absolutely incredible. They said it's incredible. All right. I'm in. Fr- another Friday night game. We had our first Friday night uh, Amazon Black Friday game yep. last year. Do you think, will this be another Amazon game? Will they be trying to I sell us Christmas that... gifts already in September? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with it. <laughs> All right. We're going to move to the NBA. Uh, next weekend, I believe, is the NBA All-Star Weekend. We talked about the three-point shootout that Steph Curry is going to do with uh, Sabrina Inescu. Yep. And it's going to be fun, but they're going to ramp it up a little bit the whole weekend because the NBA just announced yesterday <laughs> that they are going Clayton Kershaw are in agreement on a deal, the physical is on Thursday. Uh, Joel Sherman and John Heyman are reporting. It says uh, because the Dodgers Padres open season 320 and 321 in South Korea, they're beginning spring training earlier, so it can put players on the 60 day IL. Um, yeah, so he's not expected to return until the second half. So there you go. Dodgers uh, re signing Clayton Kershaw. Yeah, I mean, yeah, feels right. Good. It's nice to see them get off their ass and make a move. Um, you know, because they have been, they've had a very quiet offseason, uh, bringing back a guy that I don't think you could let 
finish his career in another uniform. He's that would have been weird. He's one of those. Is it? Uh, I mean, you mentioned he still have to pass the physical, but obviously he's not going to completely pass the physical. All yeah, they right. can say is he's he, making progress he looks toward good. his mid-season return, but clearly he's not ready to throw right now. Well, so. and if not, you know, the spending that money on him could totally torpedo the franchise, Ben. Uh, with with the money that they may waste on Clayton Kershaw, no, I mean they'll they'll be fine if he never were, pitches uh, again. They'll be fine. They were well over the luxury tax before this move. They will continue to be well over the luxury tax after this move. Correct. Bodes well for opponents in October, though. I'll say that. <laughs> All right, and then my final news here: uh, no a little bit of clout chasing. Didn't work out the way maybe somebody was hoping. Backfires sometimes on you. And it's not. I guess it's not really. Got me. Chasing. I had to wear a diaper and on the live radio. Yeah, That's making a promise making a on promise. social media yeah. and then having to uh, pay the price. It really so sucks. A teenager, I believe he's only 16 years old, made an Instagram account. His name is Eli Melky, and he lives in Iowa. Made a one. Uh, so he made a bet where he promised that he would eat a spoonful of peanut butter for every 50 followers that he got. Okay, one spoonful of peanut butter for every 50 followers. Now, there's Correct. spoons come in many different sizes. Just call it your average middle, your middle spoon. Middle spoon. The middle the cereal spoon. bowl spoon. I use the big one for cereal. You do. I do. Yeah. I don't. I I use the the medium one for yogurt. Yogurt, yes. but the big one for cereal. Like I'm like Zeke Elliott when I eat my cereal. <laughs> big old bowl, big old spoon, shoveling it in my mouth. So he uh... see now I'll use the big spoon for a scoop of peanut butter sometimes. That's fair. That's fair. But uh, for cereal, I like to go with the smaller. Just I like one or two pieces of Makes sense. cereal, not four or five pieces of cereal. Makes sense per so bite. Eli was not expecting a ton of followers, maybe some friends or family, whatever. Just see if see what would happen. Here's a little bit of audio from Eli before I tell you exactly how many followers he now has all over the internet they've been doing just certain things for so many followers and i thought well peanut butter's pretty good i was expecting it kind of as a joke to get you know maybe a couple hundred but and then once it got in the thousands it kept going and i thought it was funny at first and then once i realized how much peanut butter i had to eat then it wasn't much of a joke anymore and it was a lot of peanut butter don't worry about it so peanut butter eater 16 is his instagram handle like i said one spoonful of peanut butter for every 50 followers he is well over a hundred thousand followers now all right do the math ben well i did a math a hundred thousand divided by 50 would be two thousand spoonfuls of peanut butter i just checked the updated he's at 115 thousand divided by 50 he's at 2300 spoonfuls of peanut butter. his heart is going to explode so there's about 100 calories in one Scoop. spoonful of peanut butter. i mean he is a child this is not so if you well. had if you just went with 20 a day that would be enough for your entire like recommended caloric intake yeah. for a day. 2,000 calories. Yeah, that's How 2, many spoonful does he need? 2,300. 2,300. So... He could knock this out in 10 days? No. No. <laughs> 100 days. He'll be, yeah, about 115 days if he doesn't get any more followers. But that's not... If he's not eating anything else but peanut and trying butter. to remain in a fairly normal caloric intake... But I don't think man can live on scoops of peanut butter alone. Oh, yeah, you could. Yeah, You think you could? Yeah, it's all you need. It's got everything you're looking for. Protein, Protein yeah, carbs. Protein, carbs, you're good. Healthy fats. Yeah. I think his heart's going to explode. It's like <laughs> smoking a pack of cigarettes, though, over, the, it, over that over But you time. just said it's got everything you do. It's got need. everything. I mean, cigarettes have everything you need, too. It's not really <laughs> good for you. <laughs> it's the thing I miss most from my former life. Uh, no, I, I think uh, sometimes it does go wrong. He's not going to do it. You can't do it. You don't have. There's not enough hours in the day. I don't think to. How many could you feasibly eat at in one sitting? Oh, Four, five, one, one an hour, pretty much all day all waking day? hours of the yeah, day. Yeah, forget it. One an hour. That's not too one bad. per hour. One scoop per hour. That'll knock out. Say you're twenty three hundred hours for about four months. It's one terrible. scoop of peanut butter an hour. <laughs> yeah, he's, for four months. He's going to be clogged up. <laughs> that does not sound fun. What Good. would you do for that? For, for more, like if we got more followers? YouTube subscribers, what would you eat a spoonful of? Like for every fifty followers, yeah. Subscribers, nothing. Why? Why would I? Why would I eat? Why don't I just deliver good content? 
and have people want to it's not subscribe. That easy. Sometimes it's not you got to take it to the next sometimes level. Sometimes you got to go to the next level. <laughs> people will subscribe if they hear that you're going to eat, you know, a spoonful of canned salmon or something for every 50 followers. I know I would. You would eat a spoon. No, no, no. Of I would subscribe. No, I would subscribe <laughs> if you were. Followers. I would subscribe if you did. Mayonnaise? No, definitely not. That is fantastic. What's this kid's name? Uh, Eli Milky, but his uh, his handle is Peanut Butter Eater Sixteen. So hope peanut he's not allergic to peanuts. Forever, he knows ever. this, right? Full of videos of him eating peanut butter now. God, it's fantastic. Uh, good news. We got another pair of tickets to give away for the Padres. Uh, spring training in Peoria. Chance to go see. It's very fun. If you've never been out. It's the best. It is pretty enjoyable to go watch a game. You can go early in the day and, and check out the workouts at the Peoria Sports Complex. Our fourth caller. Call now. 833-288-0973. Fourth caller is going to win a pair of tickets. Plus... We will enter you into our grand prize drawing at the end of the month for a Southwest Airlines gift card and a one-night hotel stay made possible by the Peoria Sports Complex. Visit PeoriaBaseball.com. So tickets now, potential hotel and airfare later in the month if you are uh, if you are so fortunate. But call now, 833-288-0973. All right, uh, final segment of the day coming up next. Been a good show. It has it's been a good it's show. A- Let's uh, wrap it up on a strong note. Next with Ben and Woods on ninety seven three The Fan.
So we just told you about the uh, breaking news. The uh, Los Angeles Dodgers re-signing Clayton Kershaw. I'm assuming it's a one-year deal. Uh, there's no terms yet, but uh, we'll take his... 11 his... years, $482 million. Yeah, deferred. 480 <laughs> deferred to 3016 Um <laughs> I, and we failed to mention that the uh, Padres had signed uh, a lefty of their own. Oh, ben, good. Back at the, I think it was nice. the last day of January. Is it r- rhyme with um, Flake Mel? No. 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 Okay. Uh, it, his nickname is Big Fudge, though. And I Big thought, Fudge. I thought that was. They signed um, Big Fudge. They signed Big Fudge. It's not his name. His name is Austin Davis. He's a 31 year old left hander, stands six foot four, went two and one. With a five four seven ERA in fifty games, with the uh, with the Red Sox in twenty twenty two, nice claimed off waivers by the Twins, made two appearances for them, uh, has bounced around a little bit. Was most recently pitching for he was an Astros camp in twenty three. Joined the AAA Sugarland Space Cowboys, posted an eleven twenty two ERA in twenty five innings, then got released. Went to Indie Ball, signed with the Lake County Dock Hounds. Of the American Association, he went one and three with a four seven four in nineteen innings. He struck out twenty eight, uh, but he did all that as a starter. Then, so he is a potential name to I. The nickname is I'm what putting got, him in at number four in the rotation right a, now. Big these, fudge, big fudge. <laughs> I mean, when you can get a guy who went one and three in independent ball for the Dock Hounds, you have to do it. You've got to make that move. Minor league deal, uh, but I'm no. I'm, the nickname is it's top shelf, all world. Yeah, but I don't fudge. Know. <laughs> What's that from? No idea. It's just in your drops. Fudge. Fudge. I think that's from who the Oh, who the Fudge, fudge is Jace is Tingler. Jace Tingler. Well, one. who the Fudge is Big Fudge. <laughs> Fudgin. <laughs> Fudgin. Um, yeah. Another another arm uh, for the for the bullpen maybe even as a starter. I missed that transaction. I, I'm I missed glad it as you're well. on top of these things. Uh, yeah, I am. I am uh, scouring the scouring the wires. I mean, they must have seen something. There's something there. 64 lefty. 31 years you old. You don't just sign guys because they've got great nicknames. No, I wish they did. Uh, but Big Fudge, you know, going to give another opportunity to prove himself. I, where does that come from? I I tried to read an article that explains the um, the you know where it came from the or origin that's the word I'm looking for, and it said something having to do with the show How I Met Your Mother, but I don't watch that show, so I have no idea what they're talking about. But remember when you know when they have the player day where players can put anything on their back that they want to, yeah. and he was with the Phillies at the time, so when he pitched in the big leagues with Big Fudge on his <laughs> on his jersey, Big Fudge jersey, so um, he's nope. a big guy, uh, yeah, six four, yeah. Pretty big. So I, but again, I think it's something from the show. I don't really understand it, but I just thought that was a notable transaction uh, that that AJ Preller and his scouting department had seen something in him to assign him to a minor league deal, and he'll get a look in spring training. Fudge, big fudge. I mean, if he's getting a look, who knows? Once Ruben Niebla, yeah, gets his hands in the starts in the to fudge. mold the fudge. Yeah, into... get your hands deep in there. You know, turn it into a delicious dessert at some point. Cannot wait. All right, let's check traffic. Uh, We'll come back. Spin the topic wheel uh, for the final couple minutes of the show today. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danek. For the most part, folks are doing a pretty good job of navigating our very wet roads, which you got to watch out for. A lot of closures due to flooding. In fact, gotten reports of some mud sliding into lanes of the 28th Street off-ramp westbound King Freeway. Yeah, you might be seeing a lot of that stuff in your travels. So good idea. Give yourself plenty of extra time this morning and uh, take it extra carefully out there, especially on those transition ramps. Have those headlights on so the drivers can see you better. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. While the uh, the wheel spins, hot take. I thought fudge sickles were a little overrated. No, absolutely. Not. I agree with Ben. I one. think fudge is a little overrated, but fudge the sickles fudge is delicious. Their fudge sickles Premier. were a little icy and delicious, eh, bland for You're me. Out of your mind. <laughs> what did you like? Rocket pops. Too big. Really? Yeah. It's with the big. three colors. You know, oh, it's hard. To, it's hard for me, at least. <laughs> your shape. I'm flavor. I'm more a flavor guy. I like it thin. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> the hand motions. You know, the rocket pops are like, uh, and the fudge, you just, <laughs> be steak. 
But the fudge shingles were kind of rectangular, just boring, rectangular. Well, they had those too, but there were like skinnier ones too. Do you have push pops? I love I push, like push pops. pops. Yeah, those I like those a lot. You can nibble around the sides <laughs> of the push pop. You didn't have to go all the way, push the thing all the way in. Hope nobody oh. pulls those clips off the YouTube, to be honest with you. <laughs> too late. Oh, I will. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> I do a lot of talking with my hands here, as you can tell. <laughs> my favorite otter pops. Love otter pops. They melt really quickly. The, those are the ice. Yeah, the those, little those plastic like sleeve, one. and I have to kind of squeeze, yeah, squeeze delicious. them up and out. And then you just drink the liquid. <laughs> Go ahead, Polly. Uh, the question was, <laughs> what TV show or shows did you love as a kid? Boring. Three's Company. <laughs> Good one. Go ben, no, it's go a good no. one. Um, <laughs> as a kid, like what? What age of a kid are we talking about here? It's ten. Ten. What was I watching when I was ten? I mean, I like sitcom wise. Yeah, Three's Company, Cheers, all those. Great. I mean, those were a little more grown up though. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to remember, like back. This is a thought provoking question. This yeah. is like the hardest you've ever thought. Who's the boss? Who's the boss was great. Now, what was his bit? Growing pains. Brilliant. Yeah. They had a guy on there named Boner. Boner. Which Boner I always, Stabone. Which Richard I, Stabone. Which I, Boner you know, Stabone. You know, terrible ending in real life. Terrible. Uh, but while I was a kid watching that show, and they'd be like, Mom, Boner's here. And I'd every single time uh, that happened. So in Who's the Boss, Tony Danza... Right, Tony Maselli. He was a former baseball player, Cardinal. Yep. Yes, and what catcher, pitcher? I feel. Did they ever he, say? I feel like he was maybe a catcher. I don't know. Sam Malone was Mayday Malone, the Red Sox closer, pitcher. pitcher. Yeah. It's interesting. But uh, I don't know what happened if his wife died and he was left to take care of Alyssa Milano. Yes. Um, and then Which they, you'd sign up for immediately. And then he moved in and worked as a housekeeper for Angela Bauer. Angela. Angela, yes, yeah. Angela. who was also a single mom. She had Mona, her mother Mona, her mom, her mother, her her mother, and then she had John, Jonathan. Jonathan? I would say Jonathan. Yeah. Now, did they end up? Yeah, in the end, yeah, in the, the, end, the, 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 the final episode, they okay. finally got together and got married. I All believe. that sexual the final, tension for the whole, seasons. They kept it going the entire run the of the whole show. Run. And in the end, Tony and Angela got Angela. married. And Angela got married, and they became a family. Polly, what about you? Uh, much different shows than yeah, you guys. We're old. Uh, I grew up with like Nickelodeon, the Disney Channel. I would say my favorite show, uh, there was a cartoon called Rocket Power, okay. which is all about skateboarding, rollerblading, like kind of those extreme sports that I was really into. Okay. Great uh, cartoon. And then I loved Boy Meets World oh, it's on a great Disney show. and ABC. Yeah, the, what's her name? Topanga. Topanga. Yeah. Yeah. Probably your first love. I did not like Topanga. Oh. No, okay. I was Call much embarrassed. I was, uh, I mean, Saved by the Bell, Kelly Kapow oh, was just God. elite. Elite. Yep. I wasn't a big Topanga fan. Mm -hmm. And oh, I know that's uh, kind of sacrilege. Rudy, Dukes of Hazard. I loved Dukes oh, of Hazard. I did too. I did Absolutely too. Absolutely loved just it. Just was obsessed with it. Wanted to get in cars like that. <laughs> I mean, how on earth? I never understood because they were always chasing the Dukes, but they could never catch them. No. But they knew where they lived. I mean... <laughs> If you don't catch it's, us, you don't get It's a pretty distinctive car, honestly. I it mean, is. In a very small town of Hazard it's, it's, County. It's just, I never understood. If you can just outrun the police, you're free. You're free to go. Free. Yeah. <laughs> Damn no, it. Got no, us again. No, no consequences whatsoever. Yeah, they'll never. Cooter <laughs> will never come knocking on your door at no, your no. home. Cooter was the mechanic. Roscoe. Oh, Roscoe. Sorry. Was the, uh, the sheriff, and then he worked for Boss Hogg, who That's was right. like county commissioner or something like that. Yeah, sorry. Corrupt yeah. county commissioner. I wanted to say Cooter. Then there was Enos. Enos. He was the nicer sheriff. He was not as corrupt right as the rest of them. And then there was Daisy, who was <sighs> Catherine Bach. My God. No wonder we grew up sexualizing women with what they've shoved in our faces when we were little kids. I mean, her, her attire it was Daisy became, Dukes. became yeah. named after her. Nuts. Go ahead, Polly. Spin it again? Yeah. Yeah, why not? Let's do it. What is your favorite color? <laughs> you laugh, but these all came from... Your not supply mine. of questions. I didn't. I did not write these. Oh 
This one says, what kid stuff do you still enjoy doing as an adult? I'm die. I got to get out of here. No, it's just kid stuff. <laughs> it's just kid stuff. <laughs> Does anyone want to explain the origin of that drop? Woods? Sure, I will. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Well, there was a, a, a documentary on Netflix many, many years ago. Play it again, Paulie. Oh, Bob, it's just kid stuff. So uh, if memory <laughs> serves, it was it was it making a murderer? I don't think that's no, it was, was. it was a documentary. And that guy that's speaking <clears throat> well, lived next door to a guy uh, who was having some, uh, it was a, let's say, a bit of a dry spell at home with the missus. <laughs> and he convinced that guy, this guy. Oh, Bob, it's just kid stuff. Right. To um, help him. Uh, really get a no. uh, some relief. Choose your words carefully. Yeah, some yes. relief uh, with by his hand, and so he convinced him. Like it's like a good neighborly thing to do. Like I go to Ben's house and say, "Hey, can you help me out here? What do you got? Flat tire? Sure, I'll help you and jack this guy's up like, the car." Absolutely not. Yeah, he goes, "No, I, I'm not doing that." And no, then, he, Bob, it's just kid stuff. It's just kid stuff. Don't overreact. Yeah, it's not. It's not that big a deal. Now, the guy that says that is the one that was asked. Correct. To do this, he was, you know, going back in his memory. Yeah. And he said, oh, and the guy just told me. Oh, Bob, it's just kid stuff. It's just kid stuff. Disgusting. Absolutely repugnant. <laughs> I have neighbors. I don't know that I'd knock on their door to ask them to help me with that. As for uh, what you actually like to do as a kid, oh, yeah, you I still forgot. like to do as an adult, though, anything? Play baseball. There you go. That's a good one. Yeah. You still play baseball. Still play. I gave it up many years ago, but you like to still play and we baseball. Are, we are worse for it. <laughs> but you. What I don't think you you didn't do a lot of fun stuff as a kid. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> you didn't ride bikes. You didn't it's a good point. build forts. Just like what? Backgammon? Bridge? <laughs> I did play those things, and I still do enjoy like Scrabble. Scrabble. Still enjoy that, but I wouldn't call that kid stuff. I, I've said it before. I used to love um, when we were at the old Jack Murphy Stadium, walking around the ramps. Still like going up and down oh, the ramps at Petco the, Park, too. Yeah. <laughs> still like the ramps going still up and down you. ramps. I, like ramps. <laughs> I avoid those ramps like the play. I, know, I like when them. I, go. I like ramps. All right. I like ramps. Polly, <laughs> about you? Uh, sports, basketball, sports, baseball. Right. Yeah, still these like are, playing baseball. These are thought-provoking. Again, you Ho- hopefully you guys are playing along in your car. Oh, Lisa wants to know: Do I not know how to ride a bike? And you have no idea. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I peloton now almost every single day. So then, yeah, Which, could you do that on a real? I don't bike? know. I haven't tried in a very long time. I've, it's not like I've never ridden a bike, right? I, just but I just wasn't bikes. a. I wasn't a like bike rider to get to school or anything right. like that, and I didn't spend a lot of time on it. But I've certainly gotten up and ridden around, not done any tricks. or You didn't used to make jumps in your driveway? No, I didn't do that. We have kids in our neighborhood, though, who yeah. are making jumps right like below our house, like digging into the hillside. It's super cool. I don't know whether I should be that... Guy who yells, hey, oh, get live. off of our, but I don't. I let just them love. Live. And they're kind of wrecking some of the landscaping in the community area, but I'm going, but they're kids. And they're kids, kids they could be, be doing a lot worse things than Just because creating... you didn't do that as a kid right. doesn't mean that most of us also I, I, I do. I agree. I feel like they could be doing way worse things than creating you know, fun little bike ramps. Yeah. And just because the grass gets a little, you know, worn in those areas and doesn't look that appealing. I'm not going to make a big deal about it. I didn't call the you. HOA or anything. I just, just, just let them announced have, it on the radio. Though. Have some fun. That's <laughs> if true. anyone's listening, have these kids arrested. Sorry about these kids. All right. Uh, do we want to do one more or do we dare? Have time. We don't okay. have time. We have, What's your favorite sandwich? That is such a hard question. Such a hard Save it for question. tomorrow. We have nothing for tomorrow either. That's good. So. The, the, I will need an entire day. Because I don't have like an instant answer on favorite sandwich. Why are you already off the YouTube stream? I logged out. We have but, another show coming in after but, like two minutes. But we still have like two minutes left of our show. I was just shutting it down. And you're gone. Though. Shut it down. I like to clear out. Wally, you want to leave too and just leave me by myself give, here? Give so, Craig a, a Woods. nice Thank clean you. studio. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> it's on the agenda the rest of the day. That's a good question. I'll have to sit again uh, at the anchor desk. I believe that's my new, at least temporary, responsibility as emergency 10 News anchor. 
If you see me tonight on Channel 10, you know something has Something's gone wrong. Something's gone terribly wrong. <laughs> I'm going to do Because I'm not supposed to be on, but someone needs to be standing by to be on. I have to cut a, a sexy commercial, apparently, for uh, Sedano Ford. Ooh. Yeah, they want to make it for Valentine's sexy Day. and yeah. lovely Romantic. for Valentine's Day. So sexy. maybe we'll have some fun with that. And then uh, I will, I'm going to pick up my little guy, take him to Jersey Mike's for his birthday, and a little Benny Hanna for dinner. It's beautiful, beautiful little Tuesday. Watch the Aztecs. What time's the game? 7.30, 7.30 tonight, Fox Sports yeah. 1. Catch the first half. Is the, uh, is the place to find Aztecs and Air Force tonight. All right. All right, uh, that is it for us. Thank Annie Elston program coming up next. Thank Thanks again to Ruben Niebla, who joined us earlier in the show today. Why for, didn't we just replay that? That was would have been a good call. For executive producer and imaging director, Paul Rindel. For Stephen Woods, I'm Ben Higgins. Have a great rest of your Tuesday from all of us here at San Diego's number one sports station. Number 16 morning show in the country, out on 97.3 The Fan.